Well, hello there and a warm welcome. What follows is a conversation with James Tunney. It's our second conversation and we're still discussing themes relating to his writings and research and thought concerning systems of global governance, plantation systems, uh, systems of social control, technocracy, uh, scientocracy, uh, transhumanism, but from the perspective this time of Prometheus, uh, the mythic figure of Prometheus and the theme of the Promethean, and how this pertains to uh, the deeper history of these ideas and uh, these projects, what they are projects. And uh, this is very important. It's quite salient to many contemporary conversations we're all having. Um, so with that said, let's jump right to it. And if you have any comments, please leave them. And with that, we'll get to it. But um, yeah, it's good to see you again. Yeah, and you too. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Same here. Same here. So um, your so the 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 theme that you that you mentioned um, as I kind of reflected on it, it made me think of the notion of um, Promethean man and oh, uh, oh sorry, uh, the notion of a uh, kind of Promethean man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I was I was. Uh... I think so. I think we can go. Uh, you know, so we'll we'll play tennis on that one. We'll 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 see where it goes from. Yeah. Well, we have our rackets and uh, let's, yeah. let's, so so it's uh thank you again for for joining me and it's a pleasure seeing you again. Yeah. Well, great talking to Kamal. Looking forward to the conversation. Same here. So yeah, let's um kind of jumping into it. You mentioned the theme of uh, Prometheus. Yeah. The the myth of Prometheus and the idea of Prometheus uh, does it, it resonates a lot, uh, pertaining to this sort of project of technocratic control that I read in to some of your works this this sort of large project it, it, there's a notion of promethean man uh the notion of a prometheus who rebelled against the gods in in, in mythology so if i could ask you how would you how would you explain the concept of prometheus to you and how it's salient and, and relevant yeah to your thoughts going um I heard your com conversation with David Living Livingston about uh, in the context yeah, of yeah. angels and fallen angels. Yes. And uh, in in view of our, our your interest and mine, um, I thought it was appropriate to 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 put Prometheus into the equation, because in many ways the Promethean mythology encapsulates a lot of these uh, of these contexts. So these this is really the working myth of the technocratic technotronic society. Now, a lot of people, when I read about Prometheus years ago, I, I just didn't find it interesting. I had no interest. I didn't think the stories, the versions were interesting. And I certainly couldn't be inspired by them. There was nothing that would appeal to me. So I was never interested in them. And I, I think that's, that's the case for a lot of people. Um, but it's not the case for the people who are behind this technocratic uh, system. And Prometheus is their driving myth. And there's a curious, there's a curious phenomenon about this, and, and insofar as Prometheus is related to ideas of gods and, and, and theology, in that there's an awful lot of rejection uh, of historical figures by people in a secular context. They say, well, these figures don't exist, or they didn't exist, or they're made up. Um, and you can see that in relation to the, the Swedish church, the established church. There's only a small percentage of them that believe in in, in like Christ in Christ and belief in God. It's quite re remarkable. That, that was well, that's what you get with established churches. But um, so it, it's curious that the driving forces, the elite 
believe in this myth in, in, same, in the same way, or not in the same way, in a deeper way, than people who are who may dismiss historical reality as myth, but they don't then take it as seriously. Because if you came to the conclusion that Jesus was a myth, well, then you would probably be obliged to ascribe the same attention to the myth that you would give to other myths, but they don't. So it's obviously a move which is destined to achieve some other purpose. Mm -hmm. So the thing about Prometheus, and you mentioned Pro Promethean man, is very, very important. It, it's, it's a key to explain what we're up against, uh, what, what this technocratic, technotronic, uh, totalitarian, scientocratic system what holds it together and the figure of prometheus is all is all over that um so for people that don't know much about prometheus i'm not going to go into all the the, the variations but there's there's two types of stories uh, two or three types of stories associated with prometheus that are relevant that we just refer to one is of prometheus as a kind of trickster who tricks the gods who tricks zeus and he does so by giving him the the raw deal in a sacrifice and f attempting to fool uh, Zeus and from for for which he uh, he is punished or there are consequences. And immediately, well, we can come back to this. Immediately, we have the significance of sacrifice, which is a critical topic in all theology. It's probably a topic that which is the the number one topic that people don't pay attention to. So here we have an attempt to fool the gods, which would always strike me as a foolish thing to do. You might find that, but, you know, when you're dealing with a superior power in the long run, you're going to lose. And so that never really uh, appealed to me. And then we have this kind of tragic element where, where we, so, so that first version is associated with, with, with Hesiod and then uh, Aeschylus has a tragic version of, of, of Prometheus. We have Prometheus associate with technology, with fire, with, with sac sacrificing himself for the good of uh, people, um, and robbing robbing fire from the gods is is, is another theme uh, to help people, especially when the gods have punished humans by taking fire away. So we have Prometheus between humans uh, and the gods, having been a godlike figure at some stage before uh, before Zeus and them uh, come into power, if you like, or being a titan, he's not human and he's he's not in the current in in the current group of gods. So, so, so they're the kind of stories that have laid the base to a whole range of poetic interpretations that have preoccupied figures up to Shelley in, in particular, um, who was who was married to. Uh, Mary Shelley and Goethe and Nietzsche and on top of that story we have a few different elements we have an appeal to the Greek roots of civilization and an apparent call which was very important for the intelligentsia in Europe they saw this civilization which was also imperial and was also slave owning you know so that's another another critical thing and we have this theme going through associated with a different type of being. And that, this is the elite class. We see in Nietzsche, this is the master class. And we see this in the British Empire, this class that's entitled to govern the world. We see it in, in various descriptions about, well, we have the burden to rule the world. Now, it wasn't, I don't characterize that as associated with primarily with skin color thing. I, I, I associate with a power structure of empire that was embedded in Britain because they would willingly sacrifice their own people. So there's no affinity between the upper class and the lower class. It's just a, a, a desire and, and which becomes a desire to rule the world. So Prometheus is a convenient figure because he, he has this resentment against the existing gods. And this resentment is important motivation. It's a very, it's a critical figure for Karl Marx. So Karl Marx is driven by Prometheus. Now these are the so we're getting into the the big figures in relation to the well, world thinking, and we have all those elements of resistance against the gods. And who are the gods? Well, they're the existing systems, uh, if you like, the people of the book in many senses, uh, and all the all the variants of that. 
that's the system, the gods in the contemporary sense. So we have this effort in Germany to drag Greek mythology into as a replacement, as part of this process of de-Christianization, for example, uh, in, in Europe, um, because the idea was that science had shown that this was not true because there had been this process of arguing that religion was mythology and therefore it wasn't true and therefore there had to be a new paradigm. So the consequence of taking away the existing system that held society together was a, a new one had to be reactivated and brought into being. And Prometheus suits this master, slave-owning, uh, elite group who don't want to be ruled by principle. This is a, a fundamental principle. They don't want any dogma to, to constrain them. They, they don't want anything to any moral system. It's not even that it's uh, it's amoral. They want Im immorality if you like, as part of it. They want to be able to break the rules. And this rule-breaking thing is a consistent theme we see in a lot of the scientific projects which are described as Promethean. For example, when we see in the training of the CIA uh, and, and in, in, in special services, um, which was linked with the Manhattan Project, which was linked to the, influx or the introduction of LSD and exploration of LSD in America, and the Manhattan Project is often described as a Prom Promethean project. But when we see in, in when they're training the, the intelligence services and all, they say that we were trained to do the antithesis of the Ten Commandments. We're trained to break all the rules. We're trained to um, do the exact inverse. Now, that's maybe okay in a war situation, but it's not okay as a modus operandi that can be extrapolated to a whole society. So, Prometheus, but we, I can elaborate on this more specific details how, how it comes true, but Prometheus is a driving, a driving motif which explains and justifies uh, this mentality that uh, in, propels the eugenicist drive, the Malthusian drive, a lot of the imperial drives, the, uh, the scientific racism, I think, is, is kind of informed by that. And people forget about the role of science in the construction of racism. Um, so Prometheus is a critical figure. And you mentioned Promethean man. And in the book, Knowledge and the Sacred, uh, uh, by Sayed uh, Hussein Nasser, uh, based on his Gifford lectures in Edinburgh, he talks about Promethean man. And, and he, he draws the contrast between this Promethean man, a human figure, this, this model inspired by, by Prometheus, and the Pontifex, which is the human, uh, which is in between heaven and earth. And he argues correctly, uh, that the Pontifex figure is the perennial idea of where the human fits in. They ha they're, they're, they're from the earth, but they're linked to, to the heavens. Uh, and, and I agree with his, his essay on, on that is, is uh, very, very good. It's one of, he's one of those authors that you can go back and find different layers in every time. Um, and the, the other element to it is that Prometheus is associated in some stories with the actual creation of humans. And this is another important element. It's not not so, 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 the, so the one that shaped humans. So this ties into a number of different mythologies, but it ties into all the spiritual traditions, really, where God creates the, the or the human from the earth in some way, or that in scientific terms that we're we're we're, we're made out of the elements physically, or there's a part of us which comes from the earth, and that that occurs in relation to Prometheus as well. And we see a stark contrast between that, in my view, and the idea of uh, the Roman idea where the, the person who shaped uh, the human out of earth was cura or care, which was the, the distinctive feature that was projected into the human. But of course, in the, in the tradition or in the monotheistic the theologies, we see this breath, the, 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 the spirit breath into the thing now prometheus has got that role in in some stories but it's a curious thing because then prometheus is not the highest it's not the highest form it's not it's not the, the the highest god figure if you like giving giving life to humans it's a different it's a different regime that uh that that we must 
kind of encounter to believe that story. Although in the Roman version as well, Cura is not the highest because you have Saturn, Jupiter, etc. But that's because they give different elements. Whereas in the other elements, God breathes or gives the spirit into the uh, the form on the earth. So we have we have a, a deep engagement in a, in theology and an alternative theology. But for these for the technocrats, Prometheus is always put forward and. In particular, if anyone wants an example, they should look at 1968, Gerald Feinberg, The Promethean Project, this cri critical book. And this was, uh, this was really the, the, the synopsis of the book says, humans have no purpose, we have to give them a purpose, and the purpose will be this technical development, which was the reiteration of what the British imperial scientists had said you know, uh, in the 1920s, and they had got to in the, in the 1800s. So Prometheus is critical, and I got, uh, in the context of, I was thinking about t talking to you, we, um, uh, I was thinking about Prometheus getting on your nerves. <laughs> the story gets on my nerves to stomach that. Now, I know there's nice Prometheans, and I know there's other readings of it, and I know there's some guys that I like that are into Prometheus, but I'm putting forward their version, the, the version of these people of, of Prometheus. And uh, apart from getting on my nerves, the, the reason why I use that term is because the, the future project, the element of the Promethean project, is to literally control humans by getting into the nervous system, by physiologically controlling them. So any arguments about free will, about our capacity to make a choice, to decide of, or co to commit or submit uh, to God, for example, will not be available to us. That's not in, 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 they are making God. They are, they will be the gods. They will make God, as they have said, using artificial intelligence. A lot of the Prometheans, have, a number of Prometheans have said that. Um, and therefore, your capacity to decide or to choose God is not available to you. So this project is a much deeper project. And of course, to get there, they are not bound by any rules of morality or any anyway. So, so that's an opening statement, I think, to to, to, to get us going. Uh, I mean, that definitely gets us going. Uh, you, you mentioned multiple fascinating things. One, just a side tangent, you made an interesting reference to uh, you know, theology and like an alternative theology, and uh, the as far as the Roman myth, do you? Yeah. Do you think that, um, that the role that the myth of Prometheus came to play in Roman theology was would the Roman mythology somehow represented a um, maybe a theological split in the ancient pagan Roman society, or maybe the introduction of a of another alternative stream or element that uh, caused certain myths to be promoted over others? Is that yes, what? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the uh, if you read the uh, the version of the myth which involves cure or care, which is you, which comes up in relation to discussions of what care is, uh, what what it means, the implication is that the spirit which was given to humans is defined by this feature of care, uh, whereas in the Promethean model. Again, Prometheus is the driving force. So the human is, in, in many senses, not like Prometheus because Prometheus is the Titan. So there's uh, whether uh, whether we get the Promethean values is another issue. You might argue that actually this human is that 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 uh, Prometheus creates is is fairly a, a useless character that's not able to discover fire and you know it needs need someone else for the technology. You, you, you could argue that. Um, but the implication seems to be that this figure, if it's modeled on Prometheus, is a risk-taking uh, is the risk-taking figure who is, who is driven by doing things, with, driven by a type of foresight without the benefit of hindsight, who doesn't have a role. And this is in the myth as well. So in the myth, the... Um, the brother of one of the versions, the brother of Prometheus doesn't 
uh, doesn't uh, define or, or give a duty or, or, or a role to the human, which is why they're kind of ill-defined and therefore have to find a, a role, which, is, which, which, which ties in with this, what scientists have later, well, what are humans for? They're just accidents. They're, they, they came from nowhere. They're haphazard. It was chance that we're here. So because we've discovered that they're here by chance, we have to give them a function for the future. And this is, a, this is the perverse kind of reasoning that has followed on from uh, interpretations of Darwin's theory of evolution and Huxley's idea. You know, So yes, there's a different emphasis. There's no question in the Roman and the Greek even. Uh, whether that had, had, had important manifestations, I don't know, because you, you can't really argue that the Romans were a great, caring civilization. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so, so I don't know how much it... Or where one, or how powerful it is, but that's the 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 point in relation to Prometheus in the last two hundred years is that Prometheus is a defining myth of the post or what's intended to be the post Christian and I believe post post books. Is, uh, uh, it's not just Christianity that they intended to to eradicate. It's all religions. It's just that. They have chosen Christianity to be the next one that it's going to, or the biggest uh, challenge in its, its its views. It's interesting. Uh, cura hmm. literally means care in yeah. Latin, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. To care, to concern, and well, hence yeah. the word care that we still hmm. have today. Hmm. So that would almost suggest, that, okay, so man was either created in a caring way with care, hmm. or yeah, just this kind of like mechanistic, uh, accidental hodgepodge of, you know, uh, we'll make this guy. Can't even make fire. You know, I'll just mm -hmm. have to steal it from the heavens and give it to him because he's kind of useless. Or, uh, well, we have to presume that Prometheus really loved this creation because uh, perhaps it was a creation. Uh, or, there's another interpretation that that Prometheus, an undercurrent for me anyway, Prometheus developed a human in a spiteful way to defy the gods. That's the other another interpretation, you know, that actually Prometheus was uh, what was in some spiteful way doing their own creation uh, and you know supplanting the role of the uh, of Zeus and others. You know that that could be in it because there's a clear connection between. Prometheanism and Satanism and Luciferianism. There's, a, there's an absolute strong connection. And I think that Prometheanism was used as a cover for what was Satanism. I think that the, there's a thin veil between them. And if you look at the, uh, in some elements. So Prometheanism was an acceptable face of a more Luciferian Satanic, the idea of the fallen angel that rebels against God, the rebel. The rebel is critical motif associated with uh, Prometheus. So therefore, I believe that Prometheus was an acceptable myth to use as an umbrella for a whole range of different streams that could include all those fallen angel scenarios. But uh, in some way, Prometheus seemed to be in some way more authentic to people because it was associated with the Greeks. And of course, they could name you know, Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, and there was something therefore more linked to the path and therefore more real about this mythology, uh, as well as this, the, 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 the British Empire had this love of certain other empires because as an empire themselves, they saw themselves in that tradition, you know, Greece, uh, Egypt, and, and, and Babylon, you know, so. Right, right. It's, um, well, there's a couple of, interesting resonances that that struck me while listening to you one is you know more recently um, J.R. Tolkien um, his uh, legendarian of uh, Middle Earth prior to the character of Sauron um, who's the chief diabolical adversary in the Lord of the Rings and uh, sort of the background of the Hobbit, uh, distant background, there is a figure, Melkor, uh, whom Tolkien uh, painted as basically uh, the Satan um, of 
the beginnings of Middle Earth and this Melkor being was one of the I can't remember the this angelic order. The, yes, the, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, he was later known as Morgoth. But uh, yes. his chief sin was he was basically attempting a sort of a discordant uh, sub creation that the, uh, yes. the yeah, divine yeah. being. Uh, Ilu Iluvatar. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He created this order and these um angelic like beings and Melkor's song was dissonant from the other ones. And he he uh he in some ways has a very Promethean uh cast to him. Uh, and that he wanted to create and he wanted to create um beings that were uh not in line with the overall divine uh, plan, so it's it's it's, it's just it's, it struck me as kind of interesting that I mean Tolkien was certainly a critic of uh, the mechanization of his society of the the, the war the sort of mechanized and he also part yeah and he also saw his work as being consistent with Catholic theology so the um, it, it represented in, in in a different way. Uh, the story but in all of this there is a what james joyce and, and campbell following him talked about the monomyth in a way uh it's not really it's, it's more than that it's a story about creation and a reaction to creation and an alternative and a plan and a conflict and the individual like that as well in the pontifex with a choice between darkness and light and which version it's not that, by definition, these figures uh, come from the same source. They come from originally, you know, an angelic realm or God or whatever. But if there is to be any meaningful sense of free will, then this must be available. So um, it, it's totally consistent with the idea of a deep free will embedded in the natural law. So, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. It vindicates, it vindicates a lot of other decisions and vindicates the notion uh, of free will. But in all of those stories, this, this is absolutely consistent in different ways, whether it be the angel that rebels directly against God or some other source that, that creates an alternative, as I said, an alternative reality or wants to create an alternative reality. It's the idea that of a non-acceptance of the highest force um, and the failure to accept that um, and the willingness to uh, engage in a battle and either create an alternative race or fight over what has been created by the uh, primary source. So it, it will still amount to the same thing, although you might say, well, if the human race is created by the primary source, then the secondary source may want to create the counterfeit uh, copy to replace that, and then that proves uh, the, the uh, it proves the the power of of the the fallen angel, the the, the created the second uh, in command, uh, etc. And this is part of the subtext of Genesis, and the subtext, well, well the text that Arthur C. Clarke uses about about the Tower of Babel and all that, well, we can gain, we can regain the power that we had. So it's an earlier power that we had. Um, so uh, this, there's a remarkable consistency uh, between them. Um, and it leads to a similar, it leads to a similar result that we have this uh, desire to create, desire to prove that humanity or its equivalent can be created or recreated uh, in defiance of the existing order and of natural law without the same dogma if you want to call it without the same rules without having to abide by the rules and in fact by rejecting the existing orthodoxy so that's an important point to bear in mind because a lot of people don't or don't understand when they're dealing with some of these uh, with the promethean context or with the technocratic society is that they're not attached to any moral order 
and this is a difficult thing for people to understand, they, they, they kind of assume, they project some kind of humaneness onto groups that, that don't profess it, you know, so, and it's a very dangerous thing to do because they don't think in the same way. And then in relation to this idea of someone has lied to me, well, lying and a truth is not in this equation. The spirit of truth is not in the, the process, not in the institution. That's their advantage and disadvantage. In, in the long run, it's, it's their great disadvantage. But in the short term, you can achieve a lot, presumably, if you're telling lies all the time and have the power to, you know, to, 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 to lie about everything. So you don't have to be attached to the consequences of your actions. You must be able to work in a mass way for a, a period of time. So uh, what I'm saying is that this, this is not just about a story. It's about actual description of what, what we're facing. The Promethean man, yes, but also the Promethean machine, the Promethean machine who, who wants to become the governor of this world or the, you know, and, and in some ways the Promethean machine is, is more, more easily accessed than some of the, you know, the satanic things that people may you know, have to go further to accept as real, especially if they've rejected God, you know, they, you know, they, they, they may find it harder to believe or, or, or believe that these are just old stories, despite their, their, their persistence, you know, in, uh, among believers. Even if someone, and if someone has um, an issue with, you know, these old stories, this notion of Satan or Lucifer uh, or fallen angels or, you know, it's, Ahriman, or you know, it's you know, they okay, yeah. You could look at this as religious mythology, but it definitely appears to like the symbolic weight, the symbolic force. Does it really matter from one level if someone's a materialist, if they're an atheist or an agnostic, and if they see these things as just simply metaphors or even old boogeyman? It, it is fascinating that there are individuals with political and social power and agency who in their actions throughout history um, make references to, to these myths or, or to these symbols um, are inspired by them uh, it, it, that's that, that strikes me as, as interesting like the, the, the eugenics project you, you, so you, you mentioned eugenics Yes, this is very much a yeah you know, at this point very old project. Hmm. In fact, it's a tangent. But have you heard of a a contemporary kind of pop philosopher who goes by the title Bronze Age Pervert? <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terribly bizarre. Hmm. Um, bit of a tongue in cheek. Uh, moniker, I, I guess, but uh, yeah. he's a Romanian fellow, um, anonymous, he, for 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 several years. Although you know, one of his ex classmates outed him, so to speak, in in, in an Atlantic uh, magazine article a couple years ago. But he's uh, he's become very popular with you know with a lot of particularly like kind of younger millennial and quote unquote Gen Z, uh, young, more politically right wing, uh, but kind of dissident right wing, um, alternative right wing um, young guys who um, who are into, I, I guess, what some people are calling now the, um, well, not now, it's, I guess it's old and passe, but the quote unquote dark enlightenment. So you have this mishmash of philosophers and thinkers who really don't even cohere together. Jordan Peterson, Sam you know, Harris, um, Eric Weinstein and his brother. Um, yeah. Um, you know, on one hand, you have Stefan Molyneux. I can't pronounce his name correctly. And, and some of these other people, you know, um, the sort of like stream of dissident right-wing thought. And this guy who calls himself the Bronze Age pervert, um, He's actually very philosophical. He's very philosophically steeped and well read. I mean, he's, he's, he's he clearly knows his Plato, and, and it turns out actually he was like a philosophy major. Um, 
but his uh, kind of the linchpin of his uh, thought is that the ancient Greek philosophers were actually engaged in a purposely subversive program of selective breeding that, uh, that Plato's Republic is a sort of allegory um, for what it was a sort of allegory both exposing to those with eyes that can see and if anyone anyone out there watching this thinks that I'm butchering it please by all means let me know okay. but um, that, you know that, that if you had eyes to see you're properly philosophically trained that you could see that uh, there are layers beneath Plato's Republic and he was actually describing um, he was giving a per prescriptive not descriptive um, program and th there was this 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 theme that this, 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 this trope that was carried by this sort of stream of philosophical thinkers regarding the formation of uh, a, philosoph a philosopher king someone who yeah. was like a Nietzschean Ubermensch who was also yeah. like, you know, both philosophically and spiritually and physically mm. well endowed. And this was to be carried out through a program of selective breeding. And so that the project of what we would call the project of eugenics was very old. Um, it goes back to the earlier Greek thinkers and that this has informed, you know, certain elements within the nobility and he approves of it you know he's then hence he sees himself as a bronze age pervert he sees this sort of like conan the barbarian ethos of this mm. fantastic mythical antiquity with men who are very buff and strong and rippling with muscles who are the um apotheosis of um mm. the human potential and uh, that they were meant to be the all-conquering philosopher kings and he's he's become very popular. Like, mm -hmm. he, like there's like lots of Republican Party staffers who privately admitted in interviews and anonymously that like, yeah, everyone reads him. Everyone thinks he's great. And I guess the reason I'm bringing this up, it was seen to be kind of a trivial, popular, um, or alternative popular culture, you know, segue. But I think he's right on some level that there is a sort of subversive, that there is a sort of stream within some philosophical thought and inherited from antiquity that is, I mean, elitist isn't the right term, but I, I so I struggled to find the right words to describe this, but that the idea of inspiring a project of selectively breeding um, over men in a certain sense, maybe it's very old. And it's... Oh, that this yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's no question about that. I think he wouldn't be the only one saying that. I, I, I think it's it, it's fairly clear. It's, it's a fairly strong theme in relation to the British Empire, I think, in relation to its thinking. So I, 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 I wouldn't even say that that's a disputed point and the only point is when you say it's subversive uh, i don't I, I don't think so i think it's it's right up there at the top and especially in relation to uh, uh royalty and ideas of entitlement to to rule um there, there was a perversion of that in the sense that the the royalty because of their their methodology in relation to breathing uh, developed a lot of genetic disorders, and therefore they be, they had to double down in relation to their interest in in things. And that that's another, you know, they're, they're all sickly. They all had these diseases, and they all had this fascination with blood. So there is a a very dark uh, continuity in relation to the mystical and actual significance of blood and bloodlines. And so, so that's there's no question about uh, the interest in that. And it's manifest very, very simply in, uh, if in, in say, the royal family in Britain, it's interest in horse racing. Uh, this is what, you know, the, the Queen was, she used to buy a lot of horses in Ireland or from Ireland. And 
were fascinated with uh, with horses and breeding. The whole thing is about breeding this this stallion that can that can you know run quicker or or whatever you know and and the the price of the offspring is is amazing. But this is reflecting. Uh, dogs was the other thing that they were fascinated in relation to breeding. These ideas are there. We can draw out. They they knew they could draw out certain uh, principles, but it goes it goes through it goes through all cultures. There's one, but there is a specific Promethean element too, and the Promethean element is associated with fire. And when Benjamin Franklin is described as the modern Prometheus by Kant. He's described as the modern Prometheus because he's he's taking power, he's taking fire from the sky. So the electricity that he's getting, he calls electrical fire. Electricity is the Promethean development, if you like. So the the modus operandi of the Prometheus, the Promethean element became electricity. And deeper, although not expressed in that, is the whole area from the 1700s of electrobiology uh, that, that manifested through Galvani and Volta and Aldini. And this is the context out of which we get a clear delineation of the dichotomy uh, between uh, the human as created and a human as created in a Promethean way in the modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley, who, who takes this and manifests itself. Although there is the dream description of her vision of the story, it was also a reference to many anatomists and that they were working in London uh, at, at the time and they were experimenting on these things. Because once you understand that the human can be controlled by electricity, well, then you have on that electricity, the nervous system that can be brought back to life, that can resurrect. Then everything was opened up for them. What is life? What is life? They tried to answer this and they began to understand it as this animating force. And it's still very difficult, difficult for philosophers to describe what life is. And when you get the evolutionary theory come on and people like Spencer, they describe life as the inner world adapting to the outer world. That's you know uh, this this is is it's a kind of the 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 inner uh, through the process of adaptation we're always trying to adapt to the out, outside world so the outside world becomes determinative which is where you get the idea of the selfish gene and the extended phenotype so the beaver builds the dam and Dawkins says well this is the extended phenotype this is a projection from the genetic structure so the focus comes on the outside world created through the, the human and now what's happening is that ai and the extractive industries the promethean industries are attempting to turn us inside out to take us totally into the extended phenotype so there's no inner world to open us up to come into the body to join us up uh, so that we're turned literally inside out and that connection, the godlike possibility, is taken away. And we are fully taken into this fallen world, fully taken into the material world. And I cannot believe that the soul or spirit will transcend this consent or acquiescence to this uh, incorporation. You know, if one if one decides that one is willing to give up one's spirit or soul or whatever way you want to cons construe it. You're giving away a, a, a God-given thing or whatever way, uh, you, you, the essence of your personality, if you want to call it, for some subjugation, submission to this machine, to the Promethean man. You are submitting, in the is Islamic sense, to this human creation. And you are committing yourself to the material world, you're committing yourself to uh, hell, uh, essentially. And that's what, what I believe is is the the game. And, and, and uh, it, 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 the, the, the Promethean element, therefore, is associated with the development of uh, electrobiology, 
which comes with which is the key thing it, it com, there's a persistent interest in the authorities the bank of england in this in the 1800s i think it was had an electrobiologist working for them why they were doing that i, I, I it's not clear but there, there, there was a deep fascination with this idea of the connection between electricity and biology and this gave an idea of what life was life was this physical force there was no godlike element here it was Prometheus, if you like, has shown us it's fire. They're trying to keep it away from it. This is life, this electrical fire, this electricity. So now what's happening is the, the electrical movement, which is the basis of technocracy. Technocracy in third is about control of electricity. The idea of turning everything into electricity, as Steiner predicted, is to take the humans out of the realm of divine light as pontifex, as a prism, if you like, between uh, one realm and the other, and to turn them into el electrical uh, systems. So electricity for, for Steiner is the kind of satanic element of light. And we see this in the 1870s in the coming race, in the real story about the real is this figure that, a kind of condensate that appears and it's, it's and two races of, of people. So they, they, they were thinking about this. Uh, they didn't want the empires seeing all the influx of people into the cities. They didn't want this to continue because they wouldn't be able to maintain power. Churchill realized they wouldn't be able to maintain power when they had developed, as he wrote in his essays, or, or essay 100 years ago, shall we all commit suicide? He, he says, well, if we have a bomb the size of an orange that can destroy the world, how can we how can we rule it? And particularly when the the IRA and the, you know our thrown dynamite had been dynamiting the uh, dynamiting the, the the British and and Scotland Yard and the whole lot, and he realised that this problem w w would get bigger, which reinforced the idea that the old empires weren't going to work. It was the empire of the mind, as he said in 19, uh, 1943. And this was going to be done through the network, through the electrical network, through the telecommunications network that had been established, using computing, using Bletchley Park, using the idea of applying a rule system to control of human behavior, cybernetics. Cybernetics comes really from uh, control of animals, human behavior, as you know about the Macy Project, all that, Macy Conference, all that kind of stuff. It's utterly consistent. It's the effort to apply the Promethean logic through electricity, through control of the human soul. So what we're facing now is we're coming to the point where they believe they can technically rob your soul by interfering in your physiology, by inserting something in your body which can respond to electricity, electromagnetism, ultrasound, uh, whatever, uh, through nanotechnology, which makes you a receiver for their system, makes your inside visible and then forces you to take direction and conditioning from this system instead of committing yourself to any higher force. You won't be able to do so. So this is the manifestation of that force. So really all the things, whether you take it from a historical, literary, scientific, theological, they come to the same thing. This is going to take over your soul. This so the, the the continuity to Benjamin Franklin now mm -hmm. it what you're describing it it seems so much clearer to me like that that's this absolute uh, electricity is control of fire um it's an animating spark of life that, that if those who control this and who can create systems of control and management of it um can control humanity, would rule humanity. Uh, so this this obsession with this, it makes now perfect sense. In fact, it, it makes me also wonder if someone like, like Mesmer, Anton Mesmer, if he was also somehow it's resonating, if some of these ideas were resonating, his ideals re regarding animal magnetism, and so on and so forth. It, it would it, it would seem to me that there was a lot that was floating around in the air back then, and maybe it's a lot more connected than I previously thought. That there. Well, 
more Franklin. Consonant. What's Franklin interested? He's interested in government control, elite control, intellectuals, post office, communication, military things, the arrangement of of of, uh, of the states, and his famous cartoon "Join or Die." You join up in what? In a snake. It's it, it, it's it's the snake is is the image, and this is interesting. Well, what, well, what does a snake mean? And of course. The snake is kind of like symbolic of electricity in the sky and going back to at ancient legends. So Franklin we, is asked we, we, perhaps in... in the in the sky, and we see they, they talk about and the, the, the snake is a positive thing, as you know, in many cultures. Mm -hmm. But in the snake, as it manifests itself in the scientific mind, it's certainly a contrast to religion, but it's also about organization. It's also about symbolic of other forces. It's it's seen to be an antithesis. But Franklin is on the commission in Paris that investigates Mesmer. So he is on the commission that investigates Me Mesmer. So his his uh, so he's engaging in the scientific method. This is another man, you know, the the power of scientific method. So he's seen that this thing actually works. Whether you uh, you know they, they knew that this thing actually worked that got you could. Uh, override the mind they didn't necessarily uh, they wouldn't have ruled out that this unseen force was there because they knew there was unseen forces because that's what they were after that was the whole quest for the the cryptic secret societies was looking for all this uh, unseen power and everything they were looking at going back to ancient societies is connected with high technology the laser beams are connected with rubies for example uh, communications are connected with crystals. It's all. It, it, it's not a mere aesthetic, something that you look at. You know, it, it's a it's a deep knowledge that these things actually have significant technical power, which would would have been magic in 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 some societies. So that connection was there about mind control. It was clear. It was clear right from the start that whatever this force was or these invisible forces. They could exert control on the mind, and so so this is not new. So if we go if we come to descriptions of what's going on in with the hippies, for example, in, in San Francisco, and we look at all the milieu, and we look at Vietnam War, and we look at arguments like in the book Chaos about uh, Manson, uh, that really the the government was involved in these processes and there was concerns about the Black Panthers and there was Co Intel Pro and they were trying to mix up these, you know, to, to, to interfere in these things. And they're doing so by by mind control and by uh, prosthetics. and But really, all of these things can be traceable to a, a series of military-industrial preoccupations. Even the story of LSD from Switzerland, Geneva is critical in all these stories. You know, mm -hmm. the story is always presented as a kind of accidental thing that, that happens. But they were all looking for these drugs. They were all looking for these drugs in the 40s. The Nazis were looking for these uh, uh, drugs, for mind control drugs. The, the British had been looking for them. Uh, the British had been investigating mind control for a long time with with their soldiers. So that was embedded in the the elite groups. That well, how do we how do we control? Here, here's another part of the the, the equation. Uh, revolution was associated with a rebel, uh, with Prometheus, but it was also seen to be by Malthus and that a uh, like a physical disease in the public, because we have the the body again, which can be interfered. With. We also have the body politic, and there was this same idea that by putting forces into the society that you could control disturbances and create them. And now we're facing a situation where they are creating digital copies of us, probably, that's the way they operate, that they can model things, program us, but they are controlling us down to our nervous reactions through, through the media, through our attachments. And it's the outcome of a total system of networks that really that really all coalesce in some single visions. And in those single visions, an elite class who wants a slave class or the eradication of the people that are not them. I mean, they seem to be very content 
with eradication of the vast majority of people who they have contempt for. You know, I mean, that 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 comes through the, the, the literature uh, very, very strong, the contempt for uh, the, the, the humans. And you can see that manifest in today in Yuval Noah Harari, how he talks about people and um, this uh, this uh, kind of Promethean force in him. And he he seems very, very happy that COVID was the change in, in the future of humanity. So he he seems to believe that it was done then, you know, the, 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 the die was cast, we crossed the Rubicon, which would make you wonder whether the nanotechnology agenda has been, um, you know, um, but of course, as is said about DARPA, the 20 years ahead of us, you know, the, so the technology that we're being exposed to is, is, is kind of old technology that we know about. So um, there's no doubt that it's very possible to insert things in the body. And, and, and of course, this is this is the realization of a long dream of total governance, uh, which doesn't need then any call to any superior being. Mm. The terrifying motif, but um, it makes sense. Everything sort of it, it does come together. It makes me so. So, Prometheus, so Prometheus, would you see the adoption of the myth of, of Prometheus? And I, I do have a lot of questions regarding. Like, I'm interested. I'm very interested in the um, the history of the transmission of ideas, um, and the history of the, re the recovery of certain ideas from antiquity. And in my mind, like, there's definitely questions as far as the the manuscript traditions of certain texts, you know, how faithfully they were transmitted. And to some degree, I, I don't know how much it really matters or not, but I do wonder to what degree it may be possible that certain myths have direct continuity to antiquity versus the possibility that some may have been massaged or created out of whole cloth and back projected an antiquity to sort of um, give some sort of support or substantiation to more recent projects. So I, I for example, if um, Prometheus, I mean, it's clearly a very ancient myth, but is it possible that the way in which we receive it in the way in which we've received it from like the humanists and philologists of the Renaissance until now was the original form or I'm, I'm speculating, but no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No, you're mm -hmm. anticipating a, a point that uh, I, I would suggest as well. Um, that that's certainly very possible. I mean, it, it would have to require a study of the knowledge of Prometheus and the, as you said, the extension. And I mean, kind of various times, it was a long period of time that the only people could read this stuff was in Ireland, you know, the, the, the Greek stuff. And, you know, there was, so there was a lot of interest. Irish saved civilization. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's a lot of interest and uh, interest and stories in that. It's very, very possible. I would certainly consider as a hypothesis that Prometheus was a central symbol in a number of secret societies. And when you think of the Illuminati, for example, if you just, just take that idea, which you're getting back to this idea of electrical fire, of light, not maybe in the way, because people think, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's an intellectual enlightenment, but they're, they're not really concerned with those things. They're concerned with power not really concerned there is the concern with instrumental power instrumental knowledge knowledge and again francis bacon is the other figure going back to atlantis but they're not concerned with um, they're not concerned with for its own sake and they're certainly not concerned with it so with, to bring it back to, bring them back to god or something because they're going on a different path they're interested in power and they're interested in this exploration and they're interested in risk taking so it could be uh, I, I certainly have speculated myself. But we we cannot prove this thing, of course. But in these secret societies, that Prometheus became a symbol or of a or one or more or a group as a common denominator, 
as a a, a, a man of a symbol that could be used as a shorthand for resistance to the orthodoxy. Uh, that that's certainly possible. So yeah, I think there could be a remodern or modern kind of manifestation, if you like, in the seventeen hundreds that was associated with the growth of secret societies. And it was associated as well with, um, I think after the Reformation, there was a void a void in the world of, of well, the, the Protestants in, in relation to its, uh, the, the, the symbolism in relation to, the, and there was a replacement there, a replacement system that began to operate because people need a symbolic construct of meaning in some way to identify and they need in, for shared symbols and for communication uh, between them and, and for uh, building communities um, and it, it's very possible that prometheus actually became some working symbol a uh, working modality that 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 emerged if you look at the in okay. who's interested in these figures um uh, I, I, so, so that's certainly possible. I think, I, I think it, and it's a, it would be a more logical mm, description of what some of these organizations, because when you read about whatever theories about them, it doesn't always uh, make you happy about what the motivation of some of these guys was, if you accepted the analysis. So, so yes, I, I, I think that's that's uh, that, that's correct, um, and also. What Prometheus is oppositional to, and um, yeah, so so uh, uh, well that answers the question. And yeah, it's impossible. It would be impossible to really prove, but uh, as a hypothesis, mm. yeah, it's something I, it's something I wonder about. And pri even prior to this conversation, there there are sets of tropes and motifs that um seem to um actually well speaking of fire there's an interesting uh book i uh i think it's kind of apropos awkward but ow james billington's fire oh yes yes yeah 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 in relation to revolution and this yeah exactly yeah, yeah. that just i just made that mental connection with yes you. That's and there you go. There you, you have the connection yeah. between the revolutionary movement, the uh, the rebels, the ma still materialist uh, materialist uh, approach, and uh, again Prometheus, Marx, all that. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, important uh, important connection uh, and important perhaps corroboration of 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 the depth of or relevance of this. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. This. Um... The control of fire. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to look at what the figure is opposing. So who uh, is Prometheus opposing? Who is Who are the gods? Now, obviously, in the European context, you're talking about uh, a Christendom and you're talking about Jesus Christ and God and, uh, um, in, in that kind of God, uh, you know, despite some people would say that, that, that they weren't, but really... They, they're getting rid of all that they want to get rid of uh, uh, all that and when we come to hg wells and figures like it's clear they want to get rid of all religion it doesn't matter christianity is the one that they they had to deal with in in europe um but there was not whether they'd they'd use islam to to to, to achieve that purpose or could have deals as well there, there is this uh, they could set them against and ultimately probably set them against and say look uh, well who would have religion and everyone's fight and all this i think i do think that's part of the agenda but what has another figure which has struck me and i'm not going to use the word mytho mythological here but a religious figure is the figure of the virgin mary hmm. and this is a, a critical figure uh, and the the significance of the figure in a is it, kind of glossed over it seems to me that this force saw that it had to dislodge the Virgin Mary in, in, in Europe in particular uh, as, as, as an object, that there has been a consistent, when I, the more I look at it, a consistent pattern. And of course we have, so, so the, the Virgin Mary, of course, is, is relevant in, in Islam uh, as well. So it's not just 
it's not just in 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 Christianity. But if you travel from the top of Europe, and uh, in the last couple of years going around Europe again, it struck me when I, when I how how consistent and persistent the figures of, of of the Virgin Mary is, and how powerful a figure, and that becomes even significant in geopolitical terms because. When John Paul is trying to trying to or work for the downfall of communism in the Soviet Union, or as the story goes, uh, he goes to the Black Madonna of Chesterhova. Chesterhova being a very important place, a uh, very important Marian site, and um, you know, through all this, you have this idea that the Virgin has to be re- for, in the minds of the Prometheans. You have the idea that we have to get rid of what's there we have to get rid of these connections uh so so in the essay or in, in the chapter the famous chapter the dynamo and the virgin by henry adams in the education of henry adams it describes his going to from the political family in the united states uh, the, he it describes him going to europe going to an exhibition and realizing that here we had the great dichotomy that was happening in modernism we had the dynamo again electricity simple of electricity the powerful dynamo this was the future this was attractive it was attra- attractive in a mystical way they're, they're projecting onto this thing something deeper and, and this is also what we see in kind of gunter anders who focus on the idea of prometheus very much as an explanation and the idea of Promethean shame, the idea that we're overawed by this thing. There's an awe to it. There's a almost kind of simulacrum of religious awe. So he said, well, this is the future. What is it displacing? What is the force, the central powerful force in Europe that it's displaced? And it was the Virgin Mary, mm-hmm. hence the dynamo on the Virgin. He realized that this was, I mean, right across Europe, Notre Dame, Chartres, all, all, all across Europe, the power uh, of the Virgin Mary, which was also critical in the Reformation. The Virgin Mary is one of the key dividing lines in Protestantism, although it's, if you read the records, it's not as dividing uh, as some people suggest now. And if you talk to many Protestants, they talk, they misrepresent what Catholics think about the, the Virgin Mary. They don't worship the Virgin Mary. They don't uh, see her as, as God. Um, so, so, so a lot of these are misrepresentations. In fact, she's more like a representation of the pontifex, the the, the link between uh, heaven and earth in a, in a different realm. And then we have all the the, uh, the 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 Marian apparitions. And what I have argued is that there was a deliberate policy. So again, you have to look at what these things are doing. As I said. In Ireland, as Ireland changed from a Catholic country, uh, that uh, where the Virgin Mary was was powerful symbol, as I said in in a number of contexts before, in the eighties you get Virgin Airways coming from the heavens into Ireland for cheap travel. Virgin, 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 Virgin. No, so this is the classic thing. You have the true thing and the simulacrum. But you keep on going, then you take the one away and you don't know which is, but you have this concept of the Virgin. A young person, they hear the Virgin. They don't associate with the Virgin Mary. It's cheap travel to go to other countries. It's great promise. Madonna mm-hmm. came with MTV to Ireland. Madonna, right. Madonna, 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 the new one, Madonna. You know, that's accidental? Okay, well, if these things are just accidental, you know, fair enough. And there was an apparition famous apparition in 1830 in Paris where the Virgin Mary in one of the many uh, apparitions but in this one she instructed the known Catherine uh, Labore to make a medal have a medal made you know people say well, what with the Virgin Mary and, and, and um, but she did and you, you could have biblical biblical authority for, you know because you're, you're turning you're turning something that could be used for guns into a, a peaceful thing, you know. So, so there is deeper elements to it, and this is a this is a funny, strange aspect of all the Marian operations. There is some iconic 
element of it. There's some image or, or associated with it, which is important about the symbolism. So in this symbol, on the back of it, well, there is the in the in the vision. She often asked the receiver to have a picture made of it or or, or something. In this case, she asked. The, the known the to, to make this medal and, and to distribute it. So it's become known as the miraculous medal because it's associated with healing and protection. There's billions of them have been made and many Catholics and others wear them. So the in the image, it was the queen, or the, the, the queen of heaven, the, the Mary, uh, over the globe and standing on a snake. So this mm -hmm. is reference to Genesis. There's also reference to all this, for me, the snake that's, we get in, you know, all through the scientific uh, Benjamin Franklin, you think that the power of this, not of, because you say, well, what is the snake in, in this theological sense? It's a symbol of of connection of, of, of different forces. It's not as simple as, as people make out. But anyway, so there's a, glo a global context to it. And on the back of it, there's the letter M and a, and a, and a, 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 a cross on top of it and a lion. So that this is the, the key symbol that, that in according to the apparition, she wanted on it. So, uh, 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 you know, now you could say that this is apophenia and the, the, the finding of patterns that are not there, but they they are there consistently. Like you'd have to convince me that that uh, it was totally accidentally that all these connections don't happen. But the M, the the M, the M on the cross looks remarkably like MTV to me. Uh, it looks remarkably like MTV. But mm. when you go around Europe now, we're talking about the Virgin and the Dynamo. When you travel when I travel down to Central Europe, the biggest signs that I saw, uh, you know, the big billboards, uh, was from McDonald's. And you'd say, you'd see one from Mif McDonald's 50 kilometers away. And you say, well, well that's, a, that's a bit far, eh? 50 kilometers, you know. So, Instead of having the, the big McDonald's and all that, have a burger, they have this M. Mm. Now, in the context of an argument that we have a, 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 a direct conflict between the Virgin and electricity dynamo, and I argue that there's been an attempt to disrupt and take out the symbolism of, of the Virgin Mary, I find it very, very curious that this M is the one that's been inserted into popular consciousness when the the most powerful M as a symbol in Europe was this representation of of, of Mary. Now people say, well, that's a, a, you know that that's, but the the attempt has been to replace the spiritual fabric that existed in in Europe, and the re the reason. And method of doing that is through the electronic system, the mass system, the standardized uh, technical system, a constant thing. So actually, his perception of the connection between the, 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 the dynamo and the virgin was probably a reflection of a deep polity, a deeper polity that he was, he was aware of or understanding or the debate was going on. What would we have to get rid of? to to industrialize the minds of of, of the people you know so um again I, I i don't a lot of people that are not interested in these things would imagine that, that was something peripheral it's not for them it's not for the people that want to change the hearts and minds of so funny enough i think the virgin mary becomes a critical player in this and in relation to the most significant, one of the most significant Marian apparitions, of course, is 1917, associated with the rise of, of uh, communism, and it's in Fatima. And the curiosity of the name of Fatima, of course, which is critical in, in Islam, makes me think that, uh, which I do believe anyway, that the because the assault of this technocratic system, the New World Order, is on all religion that the higher message is about a unity at the higher levels of, of finding accommodations uh, between the people of the book the sp spiritual people 
the people that believe in spiritual consciousness and of emphasizing the connections rather than the differences which other people will will, will. so so um and if anyone doesn't believe that the Virgin Mary was significant in geopolitics. You'd have to read about the life of John Paul II. It's 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 quite it's 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 a significant it's a significant thing. So these symbolisms and theologies and and, and roles be uh, become important in this. And people may not believe that these things are important, but look at the history of the symbols, and it's it's difficult to argue that there hasn't been a sustained attempt to take away what was a, a cohesive uh, spiritual force or the reflection of a cohesive spiritual force in, 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 in Europe in particular. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's pr particularly in our, you know, kind of present day you know, context, th there's often a reluctance to want to see um, subtle connections between things it's like okay yeah you're it's like you're seeing elvis in a, in a refrigerator patch of mold or jesus mm -hmm. in the clouds and you're projecting you know, your own mental state upon the world and just seeing patterns but right when when you have repetition and constant repetition of specific tropes specific themes specific motifs over and over and over again symbols at a certain point it, it, it's just improbable to assume that we're looking at something that's simply as in the olympics in the last supper and for, for example i mean it's in your face i mean they're making it obvious to you yeah I, yeah at a certain point like it is literally in your face and mm -hmm. then what do you say as oh you know it's a creative choice we we apologize. Like, no, this is very, and it is. I find it fascinating that actually, that, um, the gross offensiveness of that opening uh, skit scenario with the Olympics. It, a lot of Muslims were very offended. And I noticed this in social media and talking, and, and you know, that there was a lot of people commenting on how this just exposes the great decadence of the West. And there's this real sense of disgust and distaste. And there are many, many European Christians and American Christians who were, were offended by it. But what I found remarkable is how many people for whom it just it just went past the, it just went under the radar and it's like, Oh, it's, it's art. Um, which struck me, my, my wife, she's, she's from Algeria and she was, she was horrified <laughs> by it. She was just like disgusted and, and horrified by it. And for, for people to say, you know, there's no intentionality here. Well, I mean, of course there's intentionality. It's there, there, you know, there, there's, you have, a artistic display and a, uh, a performance. Clearly, there's intention put into it. There's a message being put forward. What is this message? Well, I mean, there's multiple messages, but to just brush it all, you know, just say, okay, well, there's there's nothing here. You're making a big hullabaloo about nothing. Clearly not, because we're looking at a multi-million dollar um, performance that was highly staged and choreographed and it meant and, and it was intended to send a message or multiple messages you know to say that it wasn't would just be I think entirely fanciful thinking it, it, I mean clearly and it was a message put in people's face and you see the same thing with you know in the American Super Bowl uh, every year for the last several years I mean you have these spectacles that become increasingly more bizarre and symbolic. I mean, and to some degree, I wonder how much of it is might be trolling, so to speak. You know, putting something in front of people's face and just rubbing your face in it, and um, you 
I'm going on a tangent. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's no, it, no, it's not. It, 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 it's yeah. it, it's exactly right, but it, it's even uh, it's it's curious. We're well, not curious again in another Marian operation. I don't know if I mentioned it before in, in La Salette, where the sorrow of the and the, and again the I've, I've read a lot of reports about La Salette and and but the the, the key message of the, in the operation was about offending the name of Jesus uh that that, that was the, you know that was the key offense if you like that that, that the virgin mary was uh, addressing and in particular how she said how people would blame on uh, Jesus or or say his name in the context of crop failures and this and uh because uh, when i read it first i was saying it seemed you know it, it, I remember years ago reading about it and saying, well, that was the that was the, the greatest wrong. And I began to think about that over the years. And um if you believe in in uh in greater forces and, and, and Jesus and Mary, whatever, uh, and then misuse the vocation there, of course it is. If the occultists call on on, on Jesus for protection. You know, because they, they believe in in in, in the power, uh, it would be stra it is strange that people who believe in them get into a habit, and it's like this habit uh, um, among atheists. If, uh, watching a fight with uh, with Joe Rogan or whatever, and it's it's all oh, oh you know oh my god oh my and you know all these people that say that they don't believe in God are using are using you know are referring to God. In, in, so you creates this spiritual kind of inflation. It creates this uh, disrespect uh, through that process. It creates a disempowering thing. And I don't believe that that's not intentional. I don't mean by the people themselves, but in relation to how these currents are are, are, are encouraged within society. So there, there, there's no doubt that there has been a definite uh, a definite assault. It's, it's been going on for so long in the West that in a way... The people are so punch drunk by it. The assaults have been uh, so deep, so consistent. And even, of course, coming from fifth columns within the institutions that have come in and infiltrated into, say, the Catholic Church, for example. So another another example is that the Latin Mass, the traditional Mass, which which is being sidelined by the, uh, by the Church. And if you go back to people like Marcel Proust and that, there wasn't, you know, I wasn't a practicing Catholic uh, anymore, but he defended this this traditional mass. He said, "This is what the cathedrals were built for. This was the central representation of the sacrifice of Christ." Again, that idea of sacrifice. So, to 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 come to an important point, which I must mention, is that what a lot of the what a lot of the investigations lead you to is to reflect on the notion of sacrifice and the theological significance of sacrifice, because it's always primary. If we go back to Abraham and Job, what is this? Why, why is, is this so important? Why is this so important from the scriptures that we get, that you have to take this sacrifice seriously? You have to be willing to give uh, everything if if you're asked to do I mean that's what the common story is that's that's significant in in Islam of course is a ground ground that that submission to so we're, we're being told that sacrifice is, is critical and we're also have a, a shift in society and this is the shift from sacrifice and of children and uh, family, whatever, to a different type of sacrifice in, in different ways. In, in Christianity is true, uh, the figure of, of Jesus. And we have a contrast, and the contrast comes up through the Canaanites, and it comes up, th there were studies done around 19, in the first part of the 1900s by an Irish archaeologist. Some of them are disputed, they're contested, but he he... he he did studies around Gezar and 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 in, uh, in Israel, and, and and he found evidence of of the hill tribes, you know, sacrificing their their children. And these 
sacrifices in Jewish tradition are associated with Gehenna in Jerusalem and associated with the with the nefarious forces and associated with Baal and Moloch. So what do we get then in a kind of modern context, a Hollywood context, Bohemian Grove context? We get this, we get this two elements. We get this uh, reference back to Moloch and Baal uh, uh, and all that, a kind of deliberate presentation, representation of an ancient destructive thing that the people of the book were reacting against. Uh, and also we get sacrifices, but also we get the cremation of care ritual, the cremation of care. And I think that that's a deeper, a deeper thing. They presume... So the, the presentation of that, assuming it's true from all the reports, oh, well, they're just getting rid of the cares of the world. No, no. It's the symbolism of removing moral authority. It's cremation of care in the original sense that the Romans thought of the very definition of what it is to be human, mm -hmm. uh, to not have to care about. And that's totally consistent. Again, we have the fire element, all this. So we get this strange, we get this, strange parallelism uh, and it makes you uh, again in the christian term the the, the mass the tridentine mass was, was the sacrifice it was the sacrifice uh, of god or the prophet whatever way you want to you know representing um the the vicarious or the movement of, of culture away from the previous position now i understand of course there's differences in in what uh, muslims believe happened there but taking it from from the christian reading of or the you know what has happened since so and sacrifice is the significance of the sacrifice is consistent with the idea of focusing your attention away from yourself and in a number of more enlightened versions of the theory of evolution martin novak and people like that they focus mathematically on the value of cooperation and cooperation entails a sacrifice so the implication for me is that the evolution of humans, the good, the, 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 the happiness and welfare of humans is based on a spiritual principle which reflects, it's an instruction, it's a methodology, it's a way of teaching about how significant sacrifice is as a primary thing. Um, so the corruption of that is we get strange type of sacrifices but most particularly we get the sacrifice of what's significant in relation to the creation so we have the you know whether it be in, in the children in the in, in the ancient context which would be uh inconsistent it's inconsistent with the uh the supreme god and what i believe the promethean sacrifice will be so where the Promethean sacrifice, the Promethean man sacrifice will be, will be the sacrifice of humanity itself. That's where I, I, I think it believes to. And consistent with that, so Prometheus, of course, is associated with po postmodernism and the theoretical base of posthumanism with Ibn Hassan is based on Prometheus. Prometheus is there in posthumanism as a theory in, in, its, in the 70s. He, Prometheus is right there, posthumanism. So what we get is a dark version of the sacrifice, which involves the sacrifice by fire of humanity, uh, which has been predicted in many prophecies, as a deliberate policy, not as a as as a, a risk that was taken, but as a as a deliberate policy. Fit into that the weird ideas that came from reason once once in, in the French Revolution, they cut out God. And they said, well, reason is the top. It led to strange perversions, manifest most particularly in the Marquis de Sade, who came to his conclusions of reasons which involved the dark, perverse sacrifice. Uh, and that was manifested later in George Bataille, who taught acephalus, uh, the, uh, removing the head, uh, the sacrifice of and human sacrifice. The French intellectuals were interested in human sacrifice. Clear, um, 
and, and that's what they were intellectually interested in. And this is this was the inspiration for Foucault. So we have a strange nihilism coming into or informed by this driving context, which begin they all go to the same place. And you can't get away from you have a, a an idea of a benign, merciful supreme being uh, that creates uh, that created the, the the human, and a figure which is full of resentment, which doesn't care about that, and in fact was probably very happy to get rid of this created thing, especially by a replication or simulacrum to a robotic android. So, so for me, it really comes down to that, and the reason why Prometheus is getting on our nerves is to control us, to get rid of us, to create a simulacrum and to abolish not only the idea of God, but the possibility uh, of God in their, in their minds. Prometheus getting it under our skin. Hmm. Yeah, on our nerves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the, the, nerves, nerves, as of God, the hypodermic yeah. state, uh, yeah. all of these things we're talking about, under, infra, the hellish realms, infrastructure, the uh, intelligence, all that. It's and the nano domain, all this stuff going on, it's consistent with this this kind of uh, darkness, as opposed to the scriptural tradition, which says here it is, here is the message I I, I present it to you. That's what it is. This is the this is the thing. Uh, in order as a contrast to that, uh, so we have all, have to deal with all this cryptographic, clandestine, secret, cryptic system of governance intended to be a total governance system uh, as anticipated by Arendt and uh, Anderson. And, 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 yeah. and what can one say about a system of governance uh, whose uh, developers and articulators and proponents move cryptically and secretly and um, advocate its propagation and erection um, secretly. It's, it, it, I think it, it harkens back to this sort of elitist idea of a, of a particular group, a particular stream or current that sees itself as enlightened and illuminated and thus fitting and deserving fitting for and deserving of rule and power and it's um the centrality that you mentioned of the british imperial system it strikes me like okay what so which world civilization really bequeath to us the very communication networks that, that that we're on today you know it goes back to the telegraph um you know there the the british empire and then the american empire that succeeded it uh, were absolutely based on uh electronic well electrical and electronic control and signaling in cybernetics you know we, we have a cybernetic Babbage computing administration yeah yeah, yeah Babbage and his cards uh, it, it seems like this is a very old project something that was conceived of a long time ago and was steadily pushed forward um, and I do find it I find it strange that the victims of such a system often would identify so strenuously with um, their very jailers. If 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 someone, if this is a sort of, if we look at it as a plantation project, um, then it's very odd that the um, slaves and the serfs identify so heavily with the um masters of the, of the plantation well or is it 
uh, if we take Aldous Huxley, they even told us you would love your servitude. Then you had the other Huxley, um, who was, uh, I think it was Andrew, who was working on nerve signals. He was an expert on nerve signals. Then you had Leonard Huxley, who was uh, who gave famous speeches um, about eugenics. Then you had Julian Huxley, who defined transhumanism, who was uh, head of UNESCO, et cetera, et cetera, uh, who, who talked about uh, biological synthesis. And of course, Thomas uh, Henry Huxley. So they have told us, they've even indicated how it's going to happen. And uh, the folk, he's not focusing on it. The, the Huxley didn't say, yeah, you go off and study the nerve thing because it's, it's not relevant. It's right on measuring the signal, the signal input. They keep on telling you, they, they keep on pointing to what they're, what, the, what they're doing. So they have told us, you will love your servitude. Um, it's, uh, and in that, the thing that has amazed, the thing that amazes me is that uh, one, a lot of people just don't care. <laughs> they care. <laughs> they don't care about themselves. They don't believe in their soul. They've been talked out of their soul. They've talked out of the spirit. Certainly talked out of God and any any other system of belief and all that. And they've been talked out of meaning. They've been talked out of, of, of all of that. So uh, at a certain point, people make a choice. That, and, and uh, you know, and... and that's the way it is, and it's, and if they don't want to hear it, that's the way. And to a certain extent, it may all, all of this may be meant to be like that. Uh, it may be, for example, when I think about the uh, Judaism, Christianity, uh, and Islam, uh, it may be that there was meant to be embedded different aspects in different things that would ultimately in some way reconciled if they if they believed in uh, ultimately in the same thing it may be that there was there was mean meaning in that it may be uh it may be in the future that you know that out of that will 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 be rediscovered things differences subtleties that, that are helpful as we as we go for I, I think for example that christianity is critical in this story for its focus on the control of the will that it was meant to be in in, in my view a, a a a message about how the human species would be controlled with the crown of thorns with the uh, various forces through the skull god god all, all the kinds of stuff. I, I i fail to see that that's not for me when i've gone through the explaining the details before that i was not anticipated that the seamless garment that they're raffling over comes to Trier in Germany where Karl Marx was born and not only born, he wrote poems about this, ridiculing this thing and bringing it into his Promethean dream. There's a direct contrast uh, between them. Um, so, uh, and in this, and you, one says, well, if one believes all that and one believes in a higher force and one believes in that and one sees this, uh, you know, and well, the, the other point I would say is it's so far advanced that our ability to to stop it is very, very slim. We're we're in a, a chokehold. I'm not in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu time. We have a, we're in a chokehold, but someone also has our arm, both our arms, and both our feet in the thing. This is the thing that we have to to get out of. But as against that, in the overall trans historic uh, context. In relation to a determination, a type of last judgment, a type of split, a type of determination, a type of change pending the next stage of evolution, that the possibility of a choice is kind of anticipated in a lot of contexts. And this, this is the phase of choice. And also, which we cannot exclude, is... That if you believe in a divine force that, has, that interacts with humanity, you must anticipate that that divine force is interacting now and is capable of exerting itself through people and through uh, the world in whatever way it wants to do for people who want to. And therefore, 
that despite all the great uh, manifestations, machinations, system of this thing, that if you believe in this, that ultimately, although it may be at a devastating price, that it crumbles, it won't, it won't hold. Uh, now that that can be over a long period of time. I wouldn't get people too optimistic. They tell them they keep telling me that they're on the run now. That, that that's nonsense. They're doing very well. The globalists are doing great. Everything is full systems go. They're very very happy. So that all that talk is nonsense. They don't understand the problem. But in the, in in the deeper sense of it, you have to anticipate that we will have some kind of spiritual efflorescence associated with the combating of this. That this challenge was inherent in the universe, inherent in the spiritual universe, in fact reflects a, if we go back in, the, in Christian terms, as Steiner talked about, uh, uh, Michael and the angels and various contexts which believed that there was a battle in the heavens which comes to the earth and that it's a, a cosmic uh, kind of struggle. So that would be the case. So the point then would be it wouldn't be that people would relinquish their belief it would be that it would be reinforced and not only reinforced but that the things that even some of them may have thought were were kind of metaphorical are not actually metaphorical it's more true and that the spirit of truth uh, or the paraclete in, in the gospel of john manifests itself manifests itself in in, in reality it operates so uh, and it operates through the uh, the power of the apparent power of the human imagination, inspired in in the true meaning of that word. So 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 I mean I think that's that's uh, and also that it 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 will show by its it will show itself it reveal itself as true by its successful opposition to the. Well, you might call them the antichrist figures or the antichrist force or system, uh, which a lot of it is intended to be. It's um, I have a, I have a friend. He's he's from North Africa. Um, he's a yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a keen researcher and um, and scholar. But he uh, we had a we were having a geopolitical conversation. I think I said something rather naive. And he just quipped at me, um, like, come on, don't you realize the inf the empire is triumphant? And I, I, I asked, what, come again? He said, no, mm. you, you don't realize that the empire is in a triumphal uh, triumphalist mood right now. Mm. And he said that, that what, you, what you may see as weakness and, and this and that, he, he said he felt that he, the way he was reading the news and the situation is that, well, whether they objectively are or not, they think that they are absolutely um, on the verge of triumph and um, that things have never gone better for them in spite of anything that I may see in the news. Uh, or they, they may strike to me as the contrary. So his point was just be careful what I assume. <laughs> you know, don't. Mm -hmm. And um, But that's not a call for it despair um and it needn't be maybe it's just a some things take time to um pan out and, and if um if, if if this life that we're given if part of its purpose is is a test you know that uh, then we must be tested and we must be tested by you know, dark moments as well as light moments uh, by loss and gain. And if this is, if humanity is in this dark hour at which um, we face the sacrifice of our humanity, I, there, there's a um, there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, a, a, a hadith, that says, if if you're if you are planting a tree, if you're planting a seed for a tree. And, um, and the and the hour comes upon you. Just keep planting. So if if, if we're looking at doomsday itself, mm. it's mm. coming to pass, and we're in the process of planting a tree. You just continue that action. You, you keep just keep you keep going. And um, 
that strikes me. You know, there's a lot of doom and, you know, hand wringing and, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I think there's this, this, this concept that on the internet that, um, younger Gen, Gen Z youth use, they, they, they refer to being black pilled. Like there's the, hmm. the idea of the yeah. red pill in the matrix. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the opposite, the, the, the most extreme you could get is to, you're just black pilled. It's complete hmm. nihilism and despair. And so they, they'll talk about being black pilled. And it would strike me, that it would seem to me that it would be very useful for those forces those people and, and groups who are engaged in a project of trying to establish technocratic control over humanity, that despair would actually be an asset of theirs. Because, you know, if we just despair of ever being able to get away from Elon Musk's Neuralink chips mm -hmm. are even more exotic, strange, mm -hmm. graphene-based injectable things if the idea of us being in the, the literal matrix, you know, you know, that was symbolized in the movie. Well, if we're just gonna despair about it and and wring our hands and 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 fall into depression, I think that's you know, leaving leaving alone the question of who quote unquote they are, mm -hmm. but they I think that is exactly what, what they would want. If they are in such a triumphalist mood, they would want the rest of us to just be willing to give up and in, in despair and just throw in the towel. And that I think that there should be no acquiescence to um, a, to covert projects to force us into ways of life that we don't desire and don't want to choose well what what is important uh is that well you read the books as you, as you have to you follow the arguments you you wouldn't be disciplined in relation to the analysis that's a very important thing as i as i, as I know you have as you've had a long interest in these uh, issues so that's very important. So people don't talk nonsense about these issues, because obviously then it, it means that other people don't take these things seriously. So so there is a there is a demand on people to not drift from some of these things into flat air theories and and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know because it's it's meant to be so that they're ridiculed, um, and they also have to get better in relation to their. What, theological arguments or philosophical arguments and, and sociological arguments etc which is which is demanding it's not, uh, not it's not easy um and then you certainly get do get in i mean if you're following the marian thing and you say well what's the solution the solution is prayer and you kind of you know initially a person might say well how can prayer change anything how can saying prayer how can saying the rosary change the world you know but this is the consistent message that come, comes through and it, it requires you to look at the world in a different in, in a different way but ultimately as you referred uh, uh to the hadith uh from the prophet about uh, planting that's a, that of course is absolutely true in relation to the fact or is proven to me by the fact that if the world is going to end tomorrow you want to be in, in you want to be in your best spiritual state for it. So you want to be doing the things anyway. All of this is an encouragement for you individually to save your soul. So as I've said, I think Ireland will be taken over by commercial for, forces, etc. The culture, the whole, you know, history even. Um, but I understand those things. But uh, I, I can only preserve my my soul, you know, and and. Uh, if my ancestors have given blood and, and died in the thing for you know there's there's only a certain amount of things you can do if people don't if people want to go a direction let them go that direction but for the people that are interested you must understand your spiritual consciousness now where that leads you that's again it's up to your own uh path on that 
Uh, I'm certainly a perennialist, and I would certainly be in the tradition of uh, uh, Sayed, uh, Hussein, Nasser, etc., in that, and try and draw from the traditions uh, and see the similarities, and it's certainly coming from a Catholic background, but also coming from a, a very long Irish cultural thing that goes back to the time of the Greeks as well, that, that Yeats and that understood that we were a culture in Europe that had retained that because uh, in the people, because they hadn't, they, they had been colonized and weren't in a, in a position of power and they weren't industrialized. So we were in a different position. So we had that as well. And even, because I did see a, a, a Muslim scholar talking about these, and it was very interesting. Well, uh, I, I, I don't know what his exact position was. I don't know if he was a scholar, but he did talk about human rights being a recent invention. In the year 697, uh, the first international convention, 697, the first international convention on human rights for non combatants in war came from Ireland, from the monks. That's the year 697. So, also point out when we're talking about life and clay, that the story in Islam about Jesus and the birds and, and breeding life into clay uh, that comes up in, in Islamic source uh, was known in Ireland. It's in the Irish tradition, that story, although it's not in the, Bib Bib the Bible, it's in the non-canonical gospel from the infancy of Jesus. It's not in the thing. It was, in, it was known in, in, in the Irish language. So there are a lot more connections in these things. And again, the, the spiritual connection uh, with life. What were, what were, one other relevant of the passion of Christ is the Judas figure. Uh, and so what a lot of people are putting themselves in. So if you want to uh, approach it as a literary text, even, as a, a mythological, which I don't, but if, we, if, if, if assuming you don't believe in it, okay, do it as a mythological. Here is the figure that gives up everything that was dear to him once to mm -hmm. ally with the state and gets the 30 pieces of silver and realizes the dreadful consequences of that uh, in the field of blood afterwards and wants to give it back, but you can't give it back. So what we have is a Judas class now who is giving up or selling their soul for the uh, the loss of the, the human race in this post-humanist movement. So they... According to the natural laws, they will pay a big price for the gains that they are getting now. And there are many bright people who are writing off the human spirit and they must pay the consequences as far as according to these mythologies. So the universe, a natural law, God, whatever way you want to, the stories, the, the way things work out, will exact their own prices on things. Uh, so th there is a uh, the logos, the divine justice, which is an inherent in, in, in the order of things as well. Mm. So there is good reason for people who are in the systems and uh, to be careful about the, the, their decisions, to not pay. All these people that are saying we didn't understand what artificial intelligence was about, they're either lying, uh, naive, grossly naive, or... <laughs> Or, 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 or duplicitous. It cannot say when when that was the objective that they had no idea that this was doing that. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. And in all, in all of this is the spirit of truth or the paraclete, which I think in Islam would be identified by, by, with the, with the, the prophet. Uh, but the spirit of truth was identified the Holy Spirit in, uh, in 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 the Christian terms, but the consequence is the same thing of the operative force of truth in, in the cosmic sense. That ultimately cannot be opposed. So that doesn't mean that's going to be nice for us. But irrespective of that, if you believe in your spiritual consciousness, you're still going to be planting the tree because you intended to plant the tree because there was a good reason why you were planting the tree. So yes, I, they started with... with, with Dispiriting. That's what it was Huxley's objective, the X Club, 1863. And associated with that as well was a process of demoralization. 
And demoralization means what it what it says it means, taking away the moral order. It's not just making you feel bad. It's taking away the moral order of something. So that was a deeper policy. And that's what we're talking about when we say, well, how could this happen? Because it's to demoralize, to take away the moral order as well. Um, but if you sacrifice and are talked out of your spirit so that you can be possessed pending your technological possession, if you can be possessed ideologically because you have not understood who you are, you have not understood that you're a, a divine creation or a reflection of the divine, whatever way you want to put it, or the divine spark in you, you have that, uh, or a hologram or a fractal of the divine, whatever way you want to construe that. If you don't see that, well, then you're going to be persuaded by superior forces who are instrumental, which seek to achieve a particular aim. So anything I say is, is I, I also hear they go beyond the black pill with gold pills and other things like that, which would come on later. To it. So it's an endless, it's an endless game of pills. Uh, but the um, uh, yeah, so so some people they it is difficult to hear when you're, you're you're presented the same as it would be difficult as it's difficult to go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, there's something wrong here, but uh, you don't ignore it it's not getting better when when one ignores what's there you have to deal with it that's the whole point and the the sooner we deal with or begin to get our head around a robust analysis uh, there is a benefit the benefit is you keep coming back to the spirit you keep coming back to the truth of the truth that that the truth was actually true and that you know that truth is truth uh easier in an easier way and the contrast helps us so it gets easier to choose the spiritual path uh, and it becomes less possible once one begins to open up to the divine inspiration, to the prophets, to the uh, uh, the, the scriptures. To the, you begin to see, okay, I'm beginning to understand what this is all about. It's not just in the good times, when they make it a very good time, it's easy to forget those things. Uh, and in the challenging times, the value of truth becomes clearer. To, uh, uh, so, so, yeah, no dispiriting, no demoralizing. In fact, that's what that Promethean agenda is. You don't get sucked into that. And whatever way, and also requires to have to be respect for other traditions, to understand that they have fundamental truths at the core, even though you might see, and also to bear in mind that they will try, the objective is to set up religious groups against each other to have simulacra groups in them to have groups which are controlled as we see like the uh, by the cia getting involved in various that that's all over the place but we we cannot accept that as the positive representation of the of, of must be careful about that that's going to happen they're going to set up do more and more do a um use the buttons they have the triggers they have a plan they know that they can Press Israel can go off at any time. The Middle East, uh, Iran, they've been wanting to, to get for a long time. They've told us that uh, for a long time. We know that that's on, on the agenda. They've been messing around in Iran. We read uh, the various uh, histories of there uh, for, for decades and decades and decades. In fact, some of the Irish revolutionaries were, were, were out there in the British Army and said, well, what are we doing fighting over here in Mesopotamia? What's that got to do with our... In you know, and so this is a long, ongoing process. Um, and but there's nothing to be, there's nothing to be dispirited about. It's it's the, it's the opposite. It's to be filled with spirit and and to understand that these things have meaning and uh, that contrast is good uh, for your soul as well. Yeah. And James, could you? Well, two questions. Could you give me one second? Some the plug for my laptop somehow. Certainly, yeah, uh, no problem. And and also, how much time? How much more time do you have? Fire away! I'll, 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 I'm okay. All right. Just one second. Thank you. I've got a glass of water myself. I think I'll get one too.
There we go. Looks like it's this in. I don't know about you, but I've kind of gotten this habit of drinking flavored seltzer water. It's sort of become the rage here. They have the different, okay. yeah, instead of like um, pop, <laughs> soda yeah, pop. Yeah, yeah, but. So, yeah, that's not to be a trite or cliche, but I do think that's where it's at. It's, um, I think the spiritual dimension is something that, that's really, I mean, given how secular our cultures and societies are today, I think it's, it's one thing to see the sort of social, political, um, evils of these matters but i think a lot of people are kind of maybe conditioned out of seeing a greater um spiritual significance i'm curious um have you ever read jason horsley or looked at his um, stuff is he the english english writer who came from a kind of uh tradition of fabians is that the, the, the... yes yes yeah, yeah. yeah he used to have a podcast called stormy water yeah um, I, I think i've uh he's, he's been on some podcasts i've been on i've listened to yeah there's um something that you said kind of resonated with uh a, a theme uh that i saw him mention um on a podcast and then later in a book of his called 16 maps of hell and it was the idea of mapping out hell. That the, because he, he seems to have a, a similar um, concern with technocracy and transhumanism and these sort of systems of control. And he saw studying it, doing analysis as mapping out hell. And I think in, in, in his later writing, he expressed a frustration with uh, wanting to find an exit from hell. It's like, okay, it's one thing if we map out hell, now, how do we find the exit? And it's, I think his conclusions are similar to yours in that spirituality is a way out. And he, you know, he, I think he's, he was interested in Rudolf Steiner. And he saw many parallels in Steiner's writing with some of the things going on today. Um, as I think you've noticed, there's, there's a, a notion I think Steiner used this term of a kind of achromatic evil, that uh, a sort of evil that's related to the um, Persian Zoroastrian figure of Achiman versus mm -hmm. you know Satan and Lucifer, mm -hmm. um, and I find it interesting that the Steiner was writing uh, the era that he was writing in seem to be one in which a lot of this sort of mechanized um, electrically fueled um, imperial machinery was becoming increasingly noticeable. And um, I do find it kind of interesting that, that you, you, the, there are different people in different periods of time who have individually come to a similar conclusion that that a lot of this is spiritual and that um, you know while certain things must be resisted that the site of a lot of resistance has to be spiritual in prayer or in self transformation and it strikes me as fascinating that this is the that's the one thing that seems to be the most dic discouraged in our contemporary society so yeah there's um and also it also raises questions about uh what is prayer and what is the um you know and how it works and and, and the deep the deeper elements of, of that which are very very important and it also, there is also in that a very, very interesting question about uh, the the New Age and certain other spiritual traditions. And 
it is striking that a lot of interest in Orientalism, uh, aspects of Indian Indian spirituality, um, they're associated with the British Empire and the British Empire's extension in California. Uh, and a lot of these end up with a situation where I don't want to overgeneralize or certainly take away from the Indian spiritual tradition. I'm not doing that. But in, in some of its Western versions, it ends up with a very, very loose, a loose uh, cosmogony or um, that, that doesn't explain or doesn't demand a lot. And in particular, there's a very strong emphasis in contemporary spiritual New Age leaders that sell a lot in this religion of no religion of no dogma uh now and this is actually the crucial the crucial bit that in many senses the elements of spiritual development can be in some ways isolated or some elements of it you know there's a certain pattern to it that one can adopt a pattern but a lot of and, and this is what is happening particularly associated with the scientific approach to spirituality they say Yes, we understand how we can do it, and especially with psychedelics and other things, but we don't want any of that dogma. And, of course, the question is, well, well, which bits of the dogma? Is it, say, in Christian terms, you know, you, you, thou shalt not steal. Have you got a problem with that? Thou shalt not kill. You, you know, and, and people will get reluctant to answer what would have been basic assumptions in Western society. Uh, and one... Uh, one recognizes that there is a danger that a big danger that we're talking about a simulacrum of spirituality something that looks like it but is not it this is the classic inversion counterfeit modus operandi you know that you can get the benefits without the boredom of the conveyance of the totality and particularly the exoteric or revealed aspects of which are seen to be merely social or something but they're critical um, and uh, we can see that in ideas also, which were probably extracted from behaviorism. You can see this even behind some of the thinking at the time of the Manson context about behavioral sync based on how rats behaved and the the study of Colhoun or whatever his name is, who who argue, who showed that when rats were put in a confined space and given all the things that they wanted, they would begin to still you know, engage in cannibalism and strange behavior. And, and this was extrapolated to, to to humans. And there was some arguments that there was experiments going on with people about what happens when they're in condensed spaces. But but we can see uh, that be behavioral mentality. And, and insofar as there is a need even for people to cope with this pathological system we're facing, there is a, a simulacrum of spirituality, which is, which will always kind of exist, which is a, a psychic, a psychological element without any appeal to higher dimensions. And there is also a fascination in certain... Well, remember as well, in the counterculture, that um, the uh, Wilson, what's his name? Um, uh, Peter Lamborn Wilson? No, no, no. Um, what's his name? Or, or, uh, his name will come back to me. Um who wrote Prometheus Rising and the yeah. counter called, you know, uh, Robert Anton Wilson. Robert, Robert Anton Wilson. Yeah, Robert. I know Jeff has interviewed Robert Anton Wilson, but he wrote Prometheus Rising. Prometheus, counterculture, Timothy Leary, um, uh, and, and a lot of the other guys, they're talking about science and Prometheus is, is, is in the figure. So you say, well, I, I, I'm hearing this thing, but he was in. They were all interested in transhumanism as well, and um, people linked them up with a resistance to the system. They're part of the system in many senses, you know. So, uh, so, and that's a consequence. They're also rejecting traditional religions, but there's truth in the traditional religions. There can't be in, in the perennial uh, in the perennial approach. That can't be. Uh, that can't be rejected. But. An interesting feature was uh, happened in eighteen fifties to eighteen seventies. So there's a number of different things, and I think Steiner was reflecting what was happening in certainly in Catholic in Catholic prophecies and in Catholic 
perceptions and Marian apparitions. Uh, certainly, well, La Salette had happened uh, in the 1840s at the time of, in, in parallel to the growth of communism. And in the secrets, which are disputed, uh, there's often secret texts that they were told not to reveal and they come out in certain contexts or they're given to the Pope or something or he doesn't reveal them. But in we have a story in those uh, in those secret texts of a a descent of devils into the earth in the 1860s um, and Steiner places it in the 1870s um, as a similar thing a fall of dark spirits into the earth um, and this is this is fundamentally associated with the rise of modernism and modernism specifically in painting and all those things come at this time through the, the growth of mass production systems and you know the American uh, Civil War all around there. There was a there was a shift, a palpable shift, associated with the machine that Dostoevsky noticed when he's in London and he says, "Hold on, all oh, this the great exhibition." He, he he comes up and notes from the underground. He says, "This is Baal. This is worship of Baal and Moloch." But this is what he perceives when he sees all this machine thing. So we have that connection with the machine, with Baal, with Moloch. Uh, with systems, with the telegraph system, and this, these prophecies or revelations about the, the, the fall of the spirit that people like Steiner admitted, or the Pope in the Vatican hearing a God talking to the Satan, talking about the takeover of the church in a hundred years, and, and this is a fact that this led to a revival of interest in, in, in the Archangel Michael. So we have this fundamental fundamental belief that in the 1850s, 60s and 70s there was a, a a split in the heavens if you like or a war that came into the earth which was associated with modernism was associated with mechanization and which was explained by Steiner in terms of the Aramanic force and a particular bat because Ara Araman is associated with science and materialism so it has a specific manifestation which was different from the Lucif luciferian uh, approach but it's 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 the idea that things would become materialized and we see this in jacques Ellul. he says that any industrial process will ultimately and the nature of technique draw or will push out anything organic now unfortunately we are the organic element this is the nature of technique um so we, we we see all the same things that there's an association with technology that technology is not a new neutral force and the last point james joyce james joyce was taught that theosophy was a protestant sect it's very it's funny a joke he said they're all it's a protestant sect and i i i, I you know i saw it just first as a joke but then i began to understand well yeah that that's if you think about it and if you look at it and if you look at it it's it's growth in London. He, he he was talking about an offshoot from the previous tradition. Uh, uh, you know that that has there's a lot of truth in in that, um, and because of course, well, theosophy in its proper sense is the study of the divine wisdom. It's not it's it's not uh, confined to, to them with a, with a small with a small t. Um, but there, there was something deeply perceptive in that, and when when Yeats. Is he, he engages in his Irish culture? He rediscovers it because he's Protestant ascendancy, and he gets access to translations to the Irish peasant tradition, which had incorporated a lot of spirituality. Uh, and he also has connections with the, with India, which is in the same British imperial system. And we had this crossover, but the West was very good at filtering out and taking particular bits from the Indian tradition, which suited it, uh, which. You know, supported the mil militaristic approach, for example, or justified or seemed to justify a certain tradition. They're very selective about how they use these things, and they suited uh, uh, particular purposes. So uh, it's very, very clear that that this battle, I, I trace it to 1863. I think, I think there was a hundred year that hundred year period that the Pope referred to in his visions wasn't didn't start in the 1870s when he had his vision it was ongoing he was he was he was in my view he was relating 
a a a thing that had happened between 1863 and 1893. I think this is the hundred year period. I think by 1963, the die was virtually cast that the 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 incipient new world order was well established by 1963. That was a a, a significant era, a significant a juncture uh, that had ended a hundred years of modernization. And that laid the groundwork for the system, bearing in mind that twenty years earlier, Churchill had talked about the empire of the mind. Uh, that really, by the time we get to nineteen sixty three, the die is cast. That's why Philip K. Dick is seeing Satan in the sky in nineteen sixty three. That's what, you know the assassinations. And you know it's not a, it's not an accident. It's a revelation of the dark forces. You know, and people were seemed to be so shocked that they were you know they. There's still a bit, I mean, they're still only talking, um, Robert Kennedy's still only talking about, and Trump about, you know, setting up a commission to investigate the assassinations. It was a long time ago, a long time ago. Why is it only, you know, it's, it's, it's so 19, so, so thing about this, Paul, and the, that's why in the 60s we got all these Promethean projects. Now they're talking about a, ne- a, a new era that is coming. Uh, and really, the Technotronic Society was defined, was, was articulated openly by Brzezinski and people in the seventies. All the cybernetic stuff they've been working on it for quite a while. Um, the, the 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 systems were well established by that. So it's it's not something that's happening recently. All these World Economic Forum, in many ways, that's not a driving force and things. It's just a a manifestation which is is telling us the obvious. So uh, I, I think there was a connection. And, and if you look back, and there's some very good documents, people never read them. The papal encyclicals, uh, uh, 1863 and a syllabus of errors explaining what was wrong with modernism, liberalism. It was quite good, 1863, the, the, the Pope was identifying what, what the issues were. And people never referred to, the, the, to those documents. They knew what, the, what was going on. They knew what these forces... So, the idea that we've just discovered a particular problem with certain political philosophies in the last couple of years is an absurdity. It's a historical amnesia. It's a historical dementia that we have uh, that that's been created in us that we can't understand. As you were t- you were saying, the intellectual history of ideas and and what what people knew was going on and what they're opposed. So yes, uh, the. But Ste- as Steiner articulated, and I believe it's true, that we would move into the positive force was the Archangel Michael. The Archangel Michael was the the good force representing the spiritual battle in against these dark, dark forces, which manifest in science, uh, in the scientific desire to dominate everything and to turn everything into material and dispirit- despiritualize the world. Yeah. It, it that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we think. I mean, by 1860, the, the telegraph had really only largely start reaching mass adoption just a few years prior. I think it was in the mid or late 1850s. You have the American Civil War, which is a transformation, uh, a transformation of uh, total warfare from the, you know, the, the sort of late Napoleonic era, sort of like fields of valor, you know, that sort of old approach to war almost as a... Into business, a, into business, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, to like business and mechanized business. Mm. The beginning of... Springfield some... rifles, all that techniques, going, copying what happened in in uh, Venice, in the armory, in a... Mo- yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, you know, the mass adoption of photography. Yeah, it's almost as if right around the the beginning of the 1860s, we have this sort of lineaments and uh, the, the sort of, um, right around the beginning of the 1860s, we have a sort of framework set up that looks almost contemporary. Prior to that, it, it really was a different world. And after that, we have... And banking as well. 1863, we yeah. know the history of banking, critical in, in America. Right. Yeah. 
in the floating uh, greenback, yeah, um, dollars, and um, vaccination. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You're right. Which Franklin had been interested in, which Franklin wrote articles on because his son died of smallpox. I'm not going to say go into that uh, topic, but you see the uh, you see the features, as you said, uh, of what came on later and the system of mass production. You know, when when people go on about the right to bear arms and all this kind of stuff, um, uh, we forget the simple commercial imperatives behind the mass production systems that a Springfield rifle and all that, and how significant they were in relation to all the other forces uh, that were in, in operation and significant. In, and also, I often, one of the things that, that that amazes me about the American Civil War, when you see the uh, the pain inflicted on the soldiers, uh, that how it went on for so long, of course, this was one of the places where they began to inject people with derivatives of opium. They experimented because, of course, opium was the fruit of the East India Company, you know, the product, and they had mass use. And, you, you know, the people, they could quiet the people on the battlefield of the people that were suffering. A lot of the medical care was that kind of stuff. So we had, uh, again, the consistent widespread experimentation with prosthetics and drugs on the soul. And this is always the case. This is always the case. You experiment on the soldiers. You experiment on the soldiers, particularly the injured ones, particularly the mentally injured ones. That's where they learned about mind control. Uh, absolutely, they used them. They used them for technology. There's 10,000 drones at any minute over Ukraine now. They're experimenting that you can expect that over your home in a couple of years. Every system they employ, they use the battlefield to do so. These are not about strategic things. There's no way that they, uh, in the context of Afghanistan, that uh, this abandonment of all the material, it didn't matter. They had achieved their objectives. Nothing got to do with, they weren't fighting for the rights of women. You know, it's, 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 it's comical. And of course, we're talking about the same places the British Empire were fighting in uh, in the 1850s. Afghanistan, uh, Crimean War, same place, Ukraine, and they were struggling to control uh, the Holy Land as they've been struggling to do so. So, I mean, if people cannot see the historical continuity between these things and the same techniques, they're not new, they're not they're not things which which happened recently or modern or accidental. They're utterly consistent. And war is the optimum laboratory for the military industrial complex. Yeah. War is the, the ultimate driver of technocratic progress, experimentation, innovation, development. And sacrifice of people. Sacrifice of people. Lewis Mumford talked about this system being about mass sacrifice to and the, to the to the machine. Yeah, the making machine. Uh, what I find uh, something I find interesting is um as far as the uh, the, the contemporary um, concern over conspiracy theory and conspiracism and conspiratorial thinking, you you have this phenomenon of QAnon that um. You know, popped up, yeah, and in the wake of you know the Pizzagate quote unquote phenomenon, yeah. and um, you know this they exploded became you know to somewhat ludicrous degrees. We we saw the the spectacle of January six, uh, twenty twenty one, and you know, a, a very harsh cultural reaction against that extreme reaction to other matters. Uh, but what I find interesting is that one of the obsessions of QAnon um, was human sacrifice, and specifically child sacrifice and, and, and trafficking in it. And there's, on the one hand, I, you know, there, there are matters 
some of these matters should be investigated and should be looked into and should be taken seriously. You know, that human trafficking does exist. Sexual trafficking uh, does exist, not only of both minors and adults. Um, you know, there, there are, I, I think that we both agree there are things, such things as, um, and I understand that you know when when it comes to quote unquote Satanism, there's different forms of Satanism. There's theistic Satanism. There's atheistic Satanism. There's the, the Satanism of the the Church of Satan and Anton LaVey, offshoot groups like the Temple of Set mm-hmm. of um, the late um, Colonel Aquino, yep. and they would aver that, but what a theistic, what an Abraham a theistic person like myself as a practicing Muslim would allege about, you know, say, and, and I think there, there's something to this, that people have a sort of, there is a sort of comical cartoon-like picture of what people who espouse these philosophies and theologies believe in and do. Um, but I absolutely think that there is, like the, you know, the, the, the trope of, of satanically inspired murder and human sacrifice and these things. We look at, you know, are, 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 are such cults. Yeah, I mean, these things occur just as, you know, among Muslims and Christians, you know, someone could point out, well, you know, these people have done this particular evil in this particular Of course, evil. yeah. Yeah, of course. And that notwithstanding, though, like, Bohemian Grove pretended sacrifices to Moloch mm. and, or, and these things, like, okay, is this a joke or do people actually take certain things seriously? Then you look at QAnon and they, they take these tropes and these themes and it sort of exploded, I think, out of proportion. But I would almost, I would suspect that there are these things like the Franklin, uh, the, 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 the Franklin child abuse and um, savings and loan. Uh, fraud and you know trafficking scandal. There are a lot of things that are mixed up in the Franklin scandal um, in the 1980s. You have Jimmy Savile in the UK and like the, the the depth of his depravity and enablers um, and the rumors of you know cultic like occurrences of um, sexual abuse and even perhaps human sacrifice and mm-hmm. you know occasionally people are convicted of such things and it's always you know it's it's, it's a little it's this tangential little you know there's some nut somewhere or some coven of loose nuts you know or listen to one too many judas priest or slayer records and then they got funny ideas in their head and they just yeah funny little things and mm-hmm. move along but i i'm struggling to find the words to articulate where I'm going, but I almost wonder if, to one degree, there's a sort of circus-like effect in, in which certain kinds of evil are is blown up into an almost cartoonish degree, and the general public is told to focus on it, and some people run with it. But if beneath the, um, like the... Uh, the, the symbolism of Stephen King's it with this evil demonic clown um, or the band Killing Joke, who's a uh, lead singer, Jazz Coleman. Um, adopts uh, they're not to get into pop culture, but you know, they're, they're very, I think they're very artistically serious group. I don't know if you're familiar with Killing no, Joke. No, I don't. No, no, no. They're they're kind of like post punk like early late nineteen seventies early nineteen eighties post punk band that has had a bit of a resurgence, but the lead singer, um, Jazz Coleman, affects a sort of an almost he takes on a, a sort of archetypal role. Did your sound go down a little bit there? Uh, oh, sorry about that. Just a little bit. Okay. Yeah, the, the lead singer Jazz Coleman takes a bit of a he, he adopts a sort of archetypal role of a um, 
a face painted clown and he and my understanding is he he sees his performances as ritual and the i there's a certain alchemical transmutation um idea in that they the killing joke they, they take these uh certain uh, negative human emotions and they process it in their music and they present it to the audience um but the the, the symbol uh that he adopts um it, this sort of archetypal resonance you have the uh, the the joker in dc comics particularly the joker as played by heath ledger mm -hmm. in the dark knight film but also in the comic books and other manifestations of uh that character uh going back to the the pipe piper uh or, or you know har the, the harlequin and clown within the Commedia del art uh, yep. was a chaotic, um, a bringer of chaos. Trickster, Prometheus. Yes. Prometheus, the the very epitome of mm. the Promethean archetype mm. and a trickster, or Loki, and Loki, mm, yeah. the, the Loki of Germanic myth, was recycled by Marvel comics into a comic book character and develops the net. Yes. Associate with the net. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I wonder if, to some degree, there's a certain almost a you could make a pun, a killing joke being played on the general public, in which certain things are revealed, but in a very exaggerated, lurid, comical almost sense, and certain people just run with it, and everyone else looks at them and say, "Oh, this is they." This is bonkers. These people are, you know, mad as hatters. You know, keep moving mm -hmm. on. Whereas the more the, the methodical, organized regimentation of society in certain ways, which is really satanic, I would think, um, continues unimpeded, while those people who would be primed to look for you know, something untoward being done in a clandestine or covert mac manner against us, those people are running for themes and tropes of the sacrifice of little children in dark tunnels. But at the same time, I'm getting to the point in which I wonder whether or not that actually does occur on occasion. <laughs> um, you know, it's... Uh, the theme of sacrifice, like, okay, the sacrifice of the innocent, um, you know, the, 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 the resumption of this theme from antiquity of throwing children in the fire of, of Moloch or similar things. I, to some degree, it may be unimportant whether, you know, in the grand scheme of things, accidental acts, you know, not accidental, small acts of evil, whether this is, accidental to a bigger picture or a side effect or integral to it hmm. but i wonder in, as you see it where do you think the general public's okay we, we have prometheus prometheus we have this trickster we have this promethean urge this that, that's driving a project of history. Hmm. Whereas at the same time we have flare-ups or exposures or of small acts of or sometimes large acts of diabolical uh, fury and depravity that may seem to be connected to this broader picture. And do you think the general public should focus, like where should our focus be when it comes to? You've opened up a lot, <laughs> You've opened up a lot of fronts there, but <laughs> I'm very happy to answer them. I hope I answer them all. Uh, first thing, conspiracy. Anyone that doesn't believe in conspiracy is a nutter. I mean, I mean, I'll tell you why, because it's written in your laws, 
you prosecute people for it. Uh, criminal offenses associated with conspiracy. It's been used against the Nazis in the Nuremberg trial. They commit uh, conspiracy to war, a weight of aggression. It was used against Charles Manson, conspiracy to commit murder because he wasn't uh, he wasn't there at the the the, the Tate murders, etc. So conspiracy. If you say there's no such thing as conspiracy, you're obviously insane because it's it's clearly laid out. Conspiracy exists. That's why they prosecute. Uh, people for conspiracy. It's the fun. You have a Department of Antitrust in the United States, and one of its jobs is to go after conspiracies and restraint of trade. You have the Shayton, uh, the Sherman Act, the Clayton Act. So we can't. Uh, it's absurd to say conspiracies don't exist. We know where conspiracy theories came from. The problem with conspiracies is, by definition, uh, you can have an open conspiracy, which is unusual, uh, but that's what. The book, The Open Conspiracy, described the new world order. So, I mean, it's I don't well. understand people, which is a, a, which people still tell me is a conspiracy theory. Even people that I know, even because it's on, it's on Wikipedia. Even though we have a book called That New World Order, That Open Conspiracy. So, they did it openly. So, the usually you don't do conspiracy openly because it's illegal. So, if we decide that we're going to rob a bank. We're not going to tell everyone about or we're going to conspire to do so. If we do so, most of it, I, I, I bet you, if you sat down and watch any channel tonight, any programs, whatever, have those things anymore, every film, every TV thing will involve a conspiracy, whether it's in a marriage or right, or whatever, you know. So, so people saying there's no such thing as conspiracies, it's absolutely absurd. And you, you look at, uh, the history of your intelligence, how could I say? It's so absurd to say that these things don't exist. Um, in relation to the satanic thing, now, now, funny enough, of all the recent issues, the only thing that I paid no attention to at all, if you were a professor and gave me a, a, uh, a, qu a quiz or a test on QAnon, I'd get zero. I know nothing about it. I had no inclination. I, I didn't investigate. The instincts were not to go near it. I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. I know nothing about it. And I think that that was meant to be. So I'm, I'm, I'm whatever it is, I'm just not interested. It's, it's gone by me, and I probably was wise to let it go by me. In relation to the satanic thing, there's a spectrum, uh, and we, you, 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 you indicate the spectrum. And I accept that there's a lot of theatricality associated with certain Levian uh, Satanism, and, and it's a deliberate uh, uh, artistic thing in, 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 in certain cases. And when I hear someone like Levay's daughter talking, as she was talking with Jordan Peterson, I don't, don't know if you heard her talking with Jordan Peterson recently. She's a very impressive, I... very impressive uh, person, uh, very astute, very interesting. Um, so I read a book of hers, her yeah. and her Husband. So uh, only uh, recently. So I, I I was very impressed with her. So yeah, obviously there's an awful lot of intellectuals engaged in in, in those things as a problem. I understand that people tell me that we're you know we're only interested uh, in in that thing because of this oppositional thing. Remember, of course, as well that Bacon. It's not only they're anti-Abrahamic, but and and often say they're scientific. Remember. That Bacon's New Atlantis was based on, on on Abraham as being the founding father. In if you read the New Atlantis, so so <laughs> the whole scientific thing is also Abrahamic. So they claim to you know to reject superstition sometimes uh, in, in favor of science. It's also Abrahamic if you actually uh, investigate it. So then when uh, we come to the satanic thing, there is a big problem. I know about the satanic panic, but. If you wanted to cover up satanic things, you would have a satanic panic. You know, you would have something that people say, oh, satanic panic, you know. Um, here's the problem. And here's, a, again, from, from a legal perspective. Generally, in a lot of police investigations and in court cases, evidence of satanic activity is excluded because it's deemed too prejudicial. So what they say is, so they... They investigate a case and they find that there's some element with satanic things where the person was a bit interested in Satan or they have pictures of Satan or, you know, all the, some, some of the memorabilia, you know. And they say, 
well, the person won't get a fair trial if this evidence is put forward and they exclude it. So in the, the, the tragic case in Ireland, uh, where there was those elements and it was excluded. So the jury don't hear these things. Absolutely common, absolutely true in crimes. The police don't report it. So this is there's a severe case of underreporting of the elements. Now, granted, as you said, it could be some person just referring to those things without any meaningful engagement in the process. But you have to bear in mind that there is this tendency to exclude deliberately to take it out of the evidence. Now, whether that's a good thing, I don't think it's a good thing, but I understand how it operates. You know, say it's too prejudicial. Well, actually, a lot of evidence that convinces people is that type of evidence. It's, it, it's, it's not obviously it needs to be corroborated, but that must be borne in mind. And, and, and so we don't know. It's like any underreported thing. So when certainly there's going to be this, we can find evidence of whatever satanic but we can find all other kind of levels for all kind of things you can find out about irish people about muslims about this that and the other there's always prejudice of at particular times that's used against so um you can't underestimate do these things happen they, they there's plenty of evidence that they do and if you so, I, I i i respect malachi martin and you know, who's written about satanism there's an exorcist in the catholic church and, and and he wrote about he wrote about satanic masses that were that were being that took place again around uh, this time in, in in the 60s out just outside the vatican uh, by a, a group wanting to take it over so uh, if you talk to people engaged in these things they take it very very seriously and the also, this access to demonic realms, they take it very, very seriously. Um, in relation to what's happened in American politics, uh, uh, I, I don't want to, to, to again to go engage in that terrain because uh, you know I, I can't claim. But there's a lot of people, you know, say that there's you know there's more substance in these things, and of course, the the uh, the, the center of the, the black mass, if you like, as opposed to the Levian thing, the, the black mass was the inversion of the Catholic mass. So mm -hmm. it, it involves a, or it involves some type of, you know, so the, again, the sacrifice thing gone wrong, if you like. So it's also a regression and all that. So I, I, I don't rule out those, uh, those things uh, at all. Um, I, I, of course, they have to be taken with a pinch of salt. And of course, we can't have uh things being made but when people present satanic things to you daily you know and there's a certain point you can't say okay well i get the message you know what i mean so so um and also but as a counter i'll come back to that in a second as a counterpoint to that and you touched on it and you anticipated it if we look at hannah arendt's idea of the banality of evil she's talking about a situation where uh, a person is just doing their job in a system, in a bureaucracy, and therefore there's a distance from the the the, the, the damage they're doing. So it seems very, very banal. They're just doing their job, often for hygienic or medical reasons, and they're not engaged in the same way uh, about it. And what I find funny, and I've, I've remarked on this a number of times in relation to Stephen King and it, it's the funniest thing I find is that it's straight in front of you. The monster is IT, it's information technology. I mean, it's to me, it's 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 not an accident. It's information technology is the monster uh, bringing these interdimensional beings and all that kind of intentionally, unintentionally. I'm not not saying whatever about his views, but it, it really is a bit of a coincidence that they choose it information technology uh you know uh, that's it that that is it you know so um in into this you have to look at the origins of shock and awe in the enlightenment in the idea of the sublime Edmund Burke talked about Irish uh, philosopher and if you look at the origins of the literature of shock and horror stories a lot of them were associated with the upper class some of the most of the the horror novels were upper class if you if you look at the history of it. 
And if you look at, say, for example, the Gothic horror, the Irish ones, it came from the Protestant ascendancy. Uh, if you look at Bram Stoker, uh, Dracula, uh, Maturin was a pre an Anglican priest who wrote about Melmoth the Wanderer, uh, recurrent. Oscar Wilde, the picture of Dorian Gray, similar kind of split personality. Uh, you know that uh, that split the, the the horrible soul and the outward front. There was a big connection, and and there's a number of reasons for that. But it was associated with the ascendancy. You know, there's 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 some suggestion that this was a projection from the upper class that felt under threat. It could be because this is a, I was going to say about London, the immigration coming in, the upper class are feeling under threat, the population uh, explosion, machines, syphilis, syphilis was a uh, a really determinant factor for people like Huxley and all that. And I think that led to them being afraid of the body. It led to this mentality that said, not only are we going to develop the body through eugenics, but we're going to make an artificial body that can't be subject to all of these things. Because look at what syphilis does, tertiary syphilis, not uh, if, obviously if it can be treated. Um, but if you go into the I was in the London hospital in the anatomy. You can't go into it, but if one does, uh, that's where they have the elephant man skeleton. Uh, the things that struck me were the silicosis things representing the, 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 the mining industry, all the black lung, but syphilis. And you see the effects it had on the human body was really, really unbelievable. The way it looked like all the bodies melted and all that. And then, of course, yeah, we had there was this kind of romantic idea of what syphilis was, but look at Nietzsche and look at the madness that it affected him and in his writings, as as uh, some say he had this debate about whatever. But that kind of genre, there's debate about whether he he had that and all this. But there was it was knocking around, and it, it there was a great a dark or deep fear about this about the the morphology of the human that could kind of be affected by all, all these processes. So some of these things uh, affected their desire as well. But to come back to the uh, this, uh, so, so the hygienism, cleaning things and making things controlled and clean and uh, medical hygiene, which became the basis of a lot, it was in Nietzsche, but it's also in the Nazis, it's in all this eugenics, it's in all this, you know, the, the clean system and the and the, uh, the people that threaten that. Yeah, that, that that's that's a core thing. But I wanted to I'll let you mention Jimmy Savile, and I interviewed Professor Anthony Clare, uh, who I was interested in his views on law. He's dead now, but he's, he was a he, he he used to have a program on television called In the Psychiatrist Chair. So he inter interviewed people, and he, it was a good level deep interview i suppose long before dr phil it was a bit deeper than, than him uh it was good kind of insights he was trying to get an insight into the people and he was one of the few people that copped on to this jimmy savile so he said when he wrote up the interview uh in, in his published work he said there's something chilling about this you know so-called saint he, he he copped on that it wasn't right and if, if the interviews are available on the internet, uh, Professor Anthony Clare and Jimmy Savile. So uh, what was striking for me, and I think it encapsulated, he, he didn't he didn't reveal he didn't reveal much because he was playing the clown and the joker. But he asked Anthony Clare said to him, What do you want? What is it you want or what you and he said, I want ultimate freedom. I want freedom, I want ultimate freedom. And this is a key concept, ultimate freedom. This is the desire of, if you want to call it satanic, if you want to call it Promethean, if you want to call it, it's the desire to have no constraint and especially no constraints from moral rules or from God. Mm. So that's what ultimate freedom is. Uh, ultimate license to do what you want. And therefore, there's an attraction in doing something which is taboo which is against the things, which is in fact the inverse. The person gets the power from that ultimate freedom. It's a very revealing thing. So, so it ties into this idea of the natural order. There's a satisfaction in these people for going against the, the, the natural order. There's a psychopathic thing which 
uh, in the dark triad and all that gives that satisfaction that they have um, got they have got it uh, this power uh, and uh, even though they're they're kind of uh, comical uh, things as well and and the maybe is the last point you mentioned about uh, this Joker figure and uh, this uh, it's a curious it's a curious thing and the Pied Piper. And of course, that accusation is made about, or, or can be made about people like Russell Brand. Mm. Uh, because during the Olympic ceremonies, he comes in representing the child catcher in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So, <laughs> so that's who he's playing coming in. You say, well, what is he doing that for? You know, this Joker thing. You know the child catcher, children, children, sweet, sweet. You know, and and you say, well, okay, well, is that a, a bad joke or whatever? Like, Why is he doing this? So therefore, the pied piper that leads the young people, the joker that's in the cultural thing, and then has a has a. You know, I find it very interesting. Recent times, but he has this uh, tour where he, I think, something called a messiah or something, or like you know what I mean, and. You say, okay, well, you're playing with these things, but uh, well, you are playing with fire in the Promethean trickster way, but you also have to be careful. Um, so, so, so these are these are interesting parallels. The end result is that we have a whole spectrum, including the banality of evil, but these things certainly exist. This thing about the the the, the dark side is, is there. And whereas we can, the argument has been that it's been overrepresented in certain cases. Uh, there is also a case that it's been underreported. Uh, but that thing, those dark things do happen. I mean, there's so much, there's so much evident. Um, in relation to the degree of its determinative force, uh, that's what I would question, because there are different agendas. There are concentric circles around of power or power structures. If you look at the study of power structures in the United States, you see that there are certain bodies that are, are in, innocuous, apparently. Like the business council seems to be the most powerful one in the power structure, more so than than the other ones. But it never comes up in debates. The world, world, you know, world economic forum. They never mention organizations like this because they're the greatest number of connections. Uh, so, so they're innocuous systems that are where these things happen and there's certain a, a theatricality and certain a distraction and certainly people will give their attention to these fears and they can be used uh, they can be used as a simulacrum they present a spiritual world which is full of horrible things and not full really of angels and and good spirits and uh, you know they're they're full of these that's what the spiritual world is it's a simulacrum it's a, they're presenting to you something of the the lower astral planes as the sole constituent element, even though they're not admitting or they're, they're not admitting that the spiritual world exists in any sense apart from that. But insofar as it can operate on your nervous system, which is what a horror film does, these are useful things in relation to control mechanisms and uh, uh, and all of that. So what I would say, don't know about Q and, and on. But the contours of identification of this thing are are quite stable uh, through a long period of time. And, and granted, we have to be particular, be careful about uh, about attacking groups or using um, historical things or anti uh, genuine classic anti-Semitism, etc. And all that, all that constant thing that uh, that has to be careful about or. You know, people because they're interested in certain occult things. You know, I defend the people's uh, right, but if if they're engaging in or supporting a system which is going against a natural law in basic terms about taking life, etc., that's that's a whole different ball game. You know, and that's that's um, that's something that has to be investigated. But the police don't often, uh, or the courts don't, uh, and uh, you know. Brought to light. A lot of this is about taking the underworld and the cryptic and opening, opening it up, bringing things to, uh, to light. But sunlight as a disinfectant, you know, lancing boils, hmm. whatever is underneath 
And if it's fetid and rotting, you mm. have to lance the boil and mm. get the pus out. Um, you know, it makes sense, you know, to because I mean, what thrives in in darkness and obscurity? And there are certain things that maybe there's nothing going on there, but even I would the, the public imagination sometimes maybe can even create boogeymen that then mm. take a life of their own. Um, which and what you mentioned, you know, the, the sort of psychic astral um, realm being presented as a spirit world uh, and cutting humanity off from perceiving things for higher. Right. What if if not that, then what else would this sort of world of online uh, simulations? Game. No, it's not to condemn these things. I, I've played games, video games, mm -hmm. that people enjoy, but just looking at it from another view, like you point out, and it's not to condemn specific groups or tendencies and things of this nature, but you, there is this sort of mediation of reality through the screen. You know, what, what we're doing right now, we, we're, we're conversing. We're connecting, um, but we're thousands of miles away. And so these conspiring. Have, we are conspiring. We're definitely conspiring because as a right reading now, together, and even though we're not literally, but yeah. Indeed, indeed. This is conspiration and mm -hmm. conspiracy right now. But um these sorry, uh, oh, James, no, no, yeah. no, no worries. Uh, these things have, you know, have brought much good into the world. They've connected people. They, you know, people can train. They can learn things on YouTube. And but at the same time, it's yeah. I mean, like Stephen King, it it. It's. I think that to just have a saccharine and Pollyanna view of technical progress, as you know, beyond a doubt, always bringing good is is very naive. You know, it's. Mm. Um, Every new introduction of technology in society, people manage to kill themselves by accident, you know, set themselves on fire, yeah. certain things, you know, Victorian era and Edwardian era, electric tablecloths, how many people were electrocuted before 1910 because someone decided to make electric tablecloths. It's very bizarre. But um, no, the, there's a certain mediation of reality through the medium of the screen, TV, movies, now video games, I wonder if there's an increasing, if there is a sort of offloading of the human imagination and the human imaginary and imaginative and visual, uh, the visualization um, faculties that we have and an offloading of that into these technologies that are given to us and with the implantation of this system, this Promethean system, it's this getting into our nerves and under our skin. Whether the, there might be an an accompanying um, diminishing of our natural faculties of inner vision, and if there is a visionary faculty to the human being that a, a visionary faculty that um, might allow someone to perceive some uh, things of a symbolic higher order. Uh, a materialist could certainly pick that apart, but, you know, entertaining that, let's say that there is this faculty that can perceive uh, meaning, um, divine meaning or meaning of a, from a higher order of things, Express in symbols. If we're all plugged in, that faculty would, it would seem to me that it would certainly diminish and atrophy and be replaced by an artificial um, or SAS um, alternative that's actually of a lower order of being and a lower
that would just that whether we might be cut off at the level of our imagination and inner vision from anything that would transcend us and i mean what what have you know you look at the poetry of the great nations of the world and their, their, their literature their art uh, all these things came about from people being able to imagine and visionize or visualize sorry, I support that. imagine and visualize um, things and that's a real human faculty that's a real that that's that's a, not just a skill it's it almost seems to be like an organ and you see the lives of spiritual or saintly people um, people who have visions or visionary experiences um, and what they describe seems to be of a qualitatively higher order than you know, a lot of this kind of pop psychic, you know, channeling kind of stuff that seems to be a, a vogue today. And I'm wondering if what you're describing, if, if one of the uh, effects on humanity might be to completely cut off our imaginations, our ability to visualize, to picture, and to grasp meaning, actual meaning um, within symbols and cut us off from that and just feed us whatever the maintainers of the system want to feed us. Yeah. Um, generally, the media is the media for sorcery i mean really this is this is what we're talking about so the system in relation to computer games and i've seen them when i was up in, in scotland that grand theft auto came from the same place where, where i was so the um there was that stuff was in the air i saw i watched the the growth of some of these things now i i, I don't I, I i presented a paper on the use of computer games uh, in legal education and years afterwards someone said oh listen to that I didn't understand it now I understand what he was saying and I talked to people and they couldn't get it very intelligent people he said computer games and legal education how could that they just did not get it, it was incomprehensible yeah. it, 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 and these were very intelligent people and I, I got into arguments about it because I, I, I couldn't understand I think I would not understand the simple point. There was something about there was something about how people have been programmed to receive what these computer games were. Mm. And in that, I was horrified. I mean, people are used to all this first person shooter. These are obviously recruiting the soldiers of the future. That's this is why we have Prince Harry saying about killing people in Afghanistan. You know, it's obviously something similar to a computer game from his helicopter. This is why we're watching people being, you know, executed from 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 things. This, you can't say there's not a connection between those things. I think it's horrific, basically, the use of a lot of the technology. All of the technology in the education system, as is quite well documented in the studies, came from the military industrial complex. So that all this stuff, I've talked about the computer games as well. A whole lot is, the whole lot of it. I don't care what what I know there's of course there's going to be uses, but there's always you can find something useful to do in a, in a prison. Uh, you know, if I was put in a zoo, you know, a human zoo, I'd find something to do. You know, that's uh uh that's how some rats survived in this in this thing for <laughs> that uh for, you know, so uh let's not cut ourselves. Uh we're in we're in the zoom now zoo zoom you know there's a joke there i mean it, it's a we know it's called we, we know we're in this you know and, and this is this is part of, of the process i mean it's almost uh, a comic itself in a, in its reality these are all part of governance systems and whatever of course there's all these i don't i don't condemn them people want to do those games uh fair enough but uh there was there was another there's a guy on the internet called PewDiePie. Have you heard of him? I think he's the yeah. he was one of the biggest guys. He's from Gothenburg. But 
I didn't listen to, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, uh, people said, oh, I met PewDiePie, and I said, who's he? And, and you know, and I, was, I was kind of amazed at this, you know, selling computer games, but again, you're, you're in the system, so you're going to get all these uh, algorithms helping you when you're selling computer games. But then he, then he, 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 he did a little, he did a segment on reading books, and I, I was impressed with that. Uh, and so he, he started reading books. Uh, and I was in, impressed, with, you know, when anyone comes back to read books and think about things, you know. Um, but he made one interesting point. I didn't watch ma many of them. I just I watched a, a couple of them. But in the start, he said that I used to read books and discuss them in Sweden with my grandfather. And then I got into computer games. And for 10 years, I didn't read a book. So, there you go. You know, there you go. There's get a generation and break the connection, you know, uh, through computer games. Uh, and then I spotted earlier on, I remember going back to Ireland and talking to younger people. And this, this was probably 25, 30 years ago. And I talked to young people that I knew who had been convinced by Richard Dawkins about the selfish gene. People, people don't understand how powerful some of these propaganda things were to cut people off from the thing. So you can cut people off from their belief system, you know, you know, uh, by this constant work, then you can cut people off from sources, you know, through entertainment, as we know. Uh, so, okay, you might get some uh, crumbs at the end of it, but they're the part of the governance system. And of course, through these things, they get massive amounts of knowledge. If you look at NVIDIA, I think it's very, very interesting, that big artificial intelligence company in America, uh, uh, NVIDIA, and I mean, the name Nvidia. It's one of the sins in Catholicism. One of the mortals, uh, you know, the deadly sins is Nvidia and Envian. So that's the name of the company. Great. And there is this. What they do is uh, when they're developing artificial intelligence or factories and things, they they uh, develop a counterfeit of the reality in order to you know to work that the artificial intelligence can work on. And I think this is what they're doing with us. So all the information about the individuals, there's a digital simulacrum of you somewhere. And then, you know, it's easier to nudge you in particular things or to find out how you'll behave because of the amount of information. Uh, so this is a, a counterfeit element of it where your simulacrum becomes, you know, your, your avatar becomes uh, uh, important. But mm -hmm. in relation to its effect on the brain, you have that book by Michael Nairs on Nels on the indoctrinated brain. And the indoctrinated brain is quite relatively recent. So he argues that the media and the mode, uh, it would include computer games, represents a specific attack on the hippocampus. So this is not just about hypnosis. He's saying it's representing a specific, the effect of it is to undermine the hippocampus, and this is where memory and stuff is stored. So the implication being that the consequence of our exposure to this media system is an attack on memory. Uh, so, and, and that, that's right. So, but this is a deep because I can see this thing about the how it's been done so comprehensively in an Irish context that you know what was a long tradition, long connections with people, with place and things is being cut. You know, uh, and including using mass migration as a tool, et cetera, to eradicate this ancient connection. It's I've, I'm, I'm past the tragedy of it. It's it's uh, because I've, I, I, I was talking about it a few years ago and nobody's interested. Again, it's a bit of a problem when nobody listens to you. I did say about the monkeypox three and a half years ago, but nobody pays any attention. That's another story. Uh, so what's happening as the books on the, the books uh, or some of the books in AI explain is that AI is an extractive industry. Mm. And I would say it's extracting your consciousness. It's extracting the ability to control you, the executive con function, pending its, you know, its entrance into your body. Um, so all of these things uh, help and all of these things uh, go to the same objective of biotech, of you being programmable as it's uh, in the executive order in, in 2022 uh, in September, which explains about the biotech movement where they want to be able to 
program you down to your, your, your cell level. And if, again, if you look at some of the biotech company names, one of the big ones is uh, Genetrix and mm -hmm. Genetrix. And in the first, the earliest prayer to the Virgin Mary uh, that's available, it goes back to uh, 200s or, or whatever that they have. She's called a Genetrix. Hmm. So even because she's the, uh, the mother of God in the context is used. So even those, you know, these things that seem distant and modern actually keep going back. In Christianity, um, I must say, well, be, be, this, this is a different emphasis in relation to how an incarnation and that. But in Christian, in Christian theology, what is the Virgin Mary? Uh, the, the Virgin Mary is the mother, the matrix, the womb. The matrix was even there, even the idea of the matrix. Because, of course, matrix means mother and womb. So we're talking about all these matrix things. We're talking about vast simulacrums of spiritual activity that go right back, right back to the, to, to the, uh, the, the time of Christ and, and before that. Huge copies, counterfeits, even down to the people themselves. Uh, from this Promethean uh, uh, Promethean idea, so um, the yeah, I understand about people saying, "Oh yeah, we're too." If you're talking about the possession of your eternal soul, and if you're telling me that the computer game is more interesting than that, fair enough, you've made your choice. You know, I'm not saying for you, but if one is saying, well, actually, this thing is all I'm interested in in this world. Yeah, you won't have any problem living in that hellish world when you move into it. You know, you, you, in what Swedenborg said was that people are not forced to go to hell. They go of their own volition because they realize that they're, they're in some way focused on that. And I can understand what he's mean, where the person says, yeah, I am that or in the, in these self-realizations and near that experience that's actually the person i am that is the you know take the selfish gene be selfish ignore other people have no affinity have no relationships want the ultimate freedom for your own ego disregard everything disregard nature disregard humans disregard god disregard yeah okay well what do you expect at the end of it you know to be the crowds of angels there waiting for you, you know it's not going to work like that uh, even if, it, even in whatever whatever system you concede, there's none of them. You know, unless you want to pick, I don't know, Valhalla and the, but even those would have been trying to be noble in their own terms. Is you know, I mean, sacrificing that the, what was the warrior tradition, sacrificing on behalf of you know that was a noble in those terms. Uh, but when you're talking about an ignoble, focus on yourself, believe in the power of your limited mind and ego and desires reduced to nothing else uh, believing that you're a haphazard creature only defined by your will and seeking to exercise your will in a magical way or participating in conspiracies of the exercise of the will which is the feature which came out of this Nietzschean Promethean thing the will which is the classic symbol in the Crowleyan sense of magic and sorcery you have to take the consequences that, that's, how, that's all I'd say to that um, and a lot of the computer game stuff, a lot of that is certainly now. Now I'm not I'm not saying that anyone plays computer games or they can't do that. Or they can't, or, you know. I'm I'm not I'm not saying that in a puritanical way. I'm talking about the institution of them, the institution, mm -hmm. the extent of them, the the billion dollar industry based on you know first person sh shooter, etc. If we believe that there's no there's no implications of these things. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a crazy assessment. Um, so, uh, and insofar as they, we are being dragged into a game, we're dragged into a computer game. This is what we will be living in, in a, uh, in a artificially governed thing, pending our uh, demise, um, that we're entering into a total commu uh, computer game. That, that, that's what I tried to argue in my AI post-humanist book, so, um, yeah, 
most people, most ordinary people I come across have no, you know, they can only see the benefits. They can only see, you know, I, I, I hear, you know, the artificial intelligence, great, all the, my views don't have purchase in relation to the ordinary mill of things. I don't talk to people, that ordin, you know, uh, in ordinary context because they have a very favorable view uh, of, of, of technology, of the car industry, of uh, computers, of games. They're all normal for them. I don't think they're normal. Uh, all I say is that you ha me has to, I have to take the consequence of my views, and they must also take the consequence of their views. And if they don't believe there's any consequence, that's 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 fair enough. That's up to them as well. Uh, I say that the spiritual traditions warn against all these things, and and they warn us against all 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 of these uh, a lot of these things. It's just that they appear in a different way. Uh, it's the same thing, and whether whether it be a demon whispering in your ear or an algorithm trying to persuade you, it still has the same effect uh, on you. And they may be both inspired by the same the same forces. And by the way, I do believe that there are a lot more things around us. There are a lot more entities around us. I, I don't have any problem in saying that now. I, I don't have any problem in in saying that there are entities that exist around us. Uh, you know, so um, I don't care now about uh, about that or what people think about that. Yeah, fair enough. It's um, right. It's um, I wonder if 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 it's possible to obviously someone with a spiritual worldview someone who sees reality as um, having non-material dimensions uh, beyond our ability to empirically verify things and uh, versus someone who has only a particularly materialistic worldview. I'm wondering if there's a way though that some common understanding can be bridged in which, okay, recognizing the dangers of, like, like you point out, normal people only see the benefits. And there, there are benefits, um, <clears throat> benefits to something that's pitched to the general public. It's someone who only sees the benefits. Though. I'm wondering if there's what, even if they are not willing to or do not or cannot see uh, they just don't see any kind of higher uh, religious or spiritual reality but I'm wondering if there is a way a bridge of understanding between someone with a purely materialistic worldview and someone with a with a spiritual worldview in which both sides can be brought to see that this project, this project of technocratic control, this Promethean project, is absolutely dangerous and uh, potentially deadly. That, and that there is something worth preserving, not only that there is something worth preserving in humanity, um, but that the idea of you know, transhumanity, transhumanism, and posthumanity and posthumanism. is a mortal danger um, to everything that even a, that a materialist, that which a materialistic, a person with a materialistic worldview um, sees as integral and, and good to the human experience. That this project endangers what they themselves would normally value, if that, if I've expressed that hmm. uh, in a sensible way. Um, well, on that surprising, not surprisingly, but I'm, my belief is, and if I'm having talked to people, I, I generally, I, I don't try and bang my head off a wall. I don't, if you're not interested in listening to me, you won't, you won't hear me going on. Uh, you won't have me proffering my, my words of wisdom. If we don't have, see, uh, we can talk because 
uh, you were interested in these things beforehand. You have a we have a common a starting point, you know. So it's easy it's easy for us <clears throat> to cross that bridge and, and you know to, to to go deeper and to develop it. Uh, if you don't have engaged in that, it's it, it, it can be difficult uh, for people. So, and I certainly, uh, I, I, I try not to to project my views. I try and, and you know, and, and engage in the in the normal things unless uh, people want to. But in relation to <clears throat> friends that I have that are not interested in the spiritual world, uh, and some are old friends, they will not change. They they will not change, absent a direct mystical experience uh, some people have been very very much programmed or decided that this is the case and and whatever even even when i do talk about or explain when they ask me about things and explain about uh, I explain about um near-death experiences and i know people have had you know i mean and you can't dismiss them and the effect that they have had on people they say oh you know they do what what um, has been described as medical materialism. They say, well, that's, scientists have said that that's a light in the, uh, in the brain, all this kind of stuff. So it's very, very deep. It is interesting that a lot of scientists are changing. And that, that, that's an interest. So insofar as you're interested in the history of, of ideas and that, and certainly there's, there's groups that I know because I've talked to them. There's a lot of scientists who are moving into a post-material phase and they're quite open about it. they're coming out of the closet a lot more and a lot more of them are willing to talk about Kripal talk with the flip a lot of them are willing to talk about spirituality and take it seriously so that's a change that's a cultural change and that will have some some effect on people it will change the the overall uh, in, in environment but i would still probably quibble that a lot of them come to the same place it's kind of Oh, we're spiritual, not religious. We're spiritual, but you know. So there's a danger that it just is the sensation of spirit, you know, the remaining. But now I'm not saying that's bad, but it may. But uh, there is an issue about. Okay, well, you know, in your view, is okay to steal. You know, tell us the answer. I just want to know. You know, uh, so simple things. You know, it, it really is. It really is interesting. Oh, I, yeah, I think the person to do this, take the drugs and all that, and spiritual and enlightenment and all that kind of stuff. It's okay to steal. Well, I don't really know. Okay, yeah. I, I just want to. I just want to know what you, the consequences of your non-religious bit. You know, it's not difficult. You know, killing. How? Where do you stand on that? Well, you know. Uh, so, I mean, there are there. there so, so there are those dimensions. But uh, what will happen is that you know people say, "Well, I don't believe in demons." I think there's a greater chance that we will see them that they won't they won't be uh, where the, the veil is getting thin I, I think there's a greater danger that people are going to see evil that they won't be able to avoid it that they I, I, I believe there's a greater pushing of people to the wall so they can't deny it they'll be like there was a famous there was a famous early Batman bit where he's locked up by someone in one of the old black and white series in a kind of room with a pool and there's only a little ledge and there's alligators in the pool. So they're going to realize they're in that type of environment. You know, they won't be able to deny it. Their existence will be uh, in peril. Uh, we'll, we will experience that. They'll begin to say, well, when we have massive collapse of you know, economic social system, massive change, and they understand that it's a permanent cultural revolution that never stops. It's never going to stop. We're in a permanent cultural revolution. It's never going to stop changing. Tomorrow is going to be different. The next day is going to be different. It's not stopping. This is the nature of the Gometean movement. It's the dynamo. It's going on and it's not going to stay. Okay, lads, we've got here. Let's enjoy it. You know, enjoy the family thing. Enjoy the ambience. Enjoy fraternity and liberty and all that. No, there's none of that. It's moving towards this, this inexorable goal. So, uh, so, that, so they're going to see it. In, in, and um, now some people will they won't have the ability to respond to that. In fact, the huge amounts of of mental health problems, etc., are testaments to the this lack of sense of meaning and nihilism. So there's there's that tragic context. And then a lot of people will be engaged in a fruitless and what a meaningless existence because they've accepted all this 
illusory stuff and there's no meaning to it and they will find it difficult, you know. Uh, and then a lot of people will will see, okay, all those things that they were saying were true and this was for that. And even though, you know, it was a nice kind of servitude, there's something missing here. Um, so it will only be, I think, when the evidence cannot be uh, cannot be avoided. But that might be just at the time when they're locking the doors in the human zoo. <laughs> it might be, it might be uh, too late. In relation to people that are, uh, so, so for me, the the perception of the problem, and the identification of the problem, and the cause of the problem, and the history of the problem, and the history of the ideas of the problem, is fundamentally associated with a biological determinism that that dispirits the humans. They're fundamentally related. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the spiritual approach is fundamentally related. So I I, I really think you cannot avoid it. You cannot avoid a connection in relation to persuading people that just okay this is, you're getting a bad deal out of that um yeah i can I, I can understand there is that thing you don't have to and i don't i don't require people to you know to, to, to in order to accept the validity of the analysis <clears throat> to be spiritual uh, but you do have to then come to well what well, is not my ideology my pragmatic response what is it what is it that I'm, I'm pointing against? And when you understand that nearly all of the political systems are streams that lead to the same conclusion, you begin mm. to see that there's very little room to maneuver. There aren't many intellectual streams that you can pick out and say, well, this is going to solve. You know, we have a little homestead here and go up in the mountain and all that. This will be, this, you know, it won't be. And then if you say, well, well, I'm an anarchist and all that kind of, that's fine, but you know that whether there's going to be mass movements that well, uh, so i believe fundamentally that the cause of the problem and the solution to the problem are fundamentally related as we find the poison and its antidote are always close together so mm -hmm. that by focusing on the the analysis we come to the spirit by focusing on the on the spirit we come to the to the solution and that will also involve a challenge because it could be, for example, it could be that we're that Catholicism, the whole structure collapses essentially in any meaningful sense. I mean, this is difficult for people to, but there's a whole load of revolutionary things happening within the church and take over things that have been predicted. So it's it's going, it's being radically changed as as it is now. Say from an Islamic perspective, people say, "Oh, happy days!" You know, Islam. That that Islam is going to be the you know the uh, number one. Uh, the attention is it, it will come to. I think the presumption is that it will be easier to destroy Islam. That that's what that's what my my belief about their thinking. Once they've got Christianity out of the way, or use them both. So it's not necessarily happy days. And in relation as well to the supposed or, or to the supposed extension of Islam geographically and demographically, it's associated with the control mechanisms of the military-industrial complex that are bombing Muslim countries. So, you know, that has to be borne in mind. People are moving and changing position because they've been forced to do so by this uh, military system, by uh, bombing, uh, bombing Iraq and bombing Libya and bombing Syria and bombing even going back to Yugoslavia, you know. So, so all of this is associated with a bigger gain. And I believe that all religious people will lose out. So from that, there's an imperative for people that are in different religious camps to find a common interest. And you don't have to persuade a person from another spiritual tradition that there's another dimension to the world. They accept some of these things. And better than that, they accept a lot of the same characters. They accept... Abraham and they accept what has happened as uh, uh, you know uh, as an important part of, of the the story of the common story they share these things they share uh, Christ in different ways uh, uh, Mary or Mariam or you know th these 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 are common heritages so you don't have to go you know uh, you, you don't have to go so far in order to understand uh, the commonalities as as the perennial tradition so then there's also going to be the people coming from falling, failing religious systems, which are, are really secular and not really committed to any, uh, you know, which have become materialistic. 
they will will go. There will be people going from them seeking genuine things as well. I'm sorry, Farmia. That's my wife's phone. She left it, and uh, it's not yeah. Sure. Uh, it's Ah, uh, technology. Yeah. I don't know how to turn this her ringer off or down. I don't have a phone, so I can't help you. <laughs> You're not missing much. Well, so, I have to finish off that. Uh, so, in relation to the, the people that don't believe in spiritual consciousness, what they should think about is, well, what is consciousness? Because uh, I, I say it's spiritual consciousness anyway, but okay, put aside the spiritual thing. These people are saying you have no free will, there's no such thing as consciousness, you have no personhood, you have no humanity, and they're taken away. If you're happy with that, that's great. Happy days. I'm glad you're happy. But really, is it, serious, is seriously accepting that, or anyone that has studied literature, studied the humanities, are you willing to give up? Do you believe there's nothing there? Do you believe it's not an illusion? And even in the spiritual traditions, for example, uh, non-dualism. Non it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people are very interested in, in non-dualism. And, uh, and I was looking at the Google Ngram on that, and uh, non-dual really comes around, around the year 2000 and begins to go up like that, you know. Um, but in the Indian tradition, of course, is ancient and ad, ad vita and, and, and all that. But non-dualism is quite Western in this thing. And you look at some of the, you know, they look at some of the applications of that. And it comes to kind of things that may sound good, but may could be something different. They could also support the post-human condition, you know, your personal, you know, part of the, there's no you and all this kind of stuff. So it, it, really some of the religious traditions in the way they're being presented to us are going to be tested as well. And uh, there is a, uh, the ones that are worthwhile will survive and they will also be reinterpreted, reapplied, readjusted, reimagined in some parts and in, in some applications um, and they will be fit for purpose. And that's the interesting thing. So, um, so, uh, so, so I think actually, Christian now in America, Christianity is is, is is the Protestants have taken Christianity to mean being Protestant, but of course it's not that. And I, in particular, emphasize early Christianity, going back, you know, to the three uh, hundreds, four hundreds, five hundreds, that that period. I think that was that was, you know, you can see a lot a lot a lot of richness there. Or the ninth century Erugena, when his description of God was uh, hugely different from what came afterwards from from an Irish context. So. A lot more commonalities to be to be take uh, taken again. But the person who believes that because there's, there's a series of a chain set of beliefs, and I know, I, I, especially with my English friends, because there's a very strong tradition of a kind of empirical uh, thing in in my English and working class or, or or business people, and you know all of this is 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 kind of nonsense. They kind of begin to look at me a bit funny, you know, and kind of wonder, am I winding them up? Uh, and so really, really, it's, it's a strong, it's a strong uh, thing. Um, and uh, many of them won't change. I'm not going to try and change them. Uh, they, they just won't. They're very happy. Um, some of them are a bit more skeptical about about the world. But you, my problem is that if you don't have a an overall sense of truth, if you believe that still, you know, you, you take on a lot of the scientific elements of scientism into your life thing, your ability to judge and be disorientated or your ability to, to judge is diminished and your capacity to be disorientated is increased. So I don't believe it's like that with, with the champions of reason, like the Marquis of Marquis de Sade, what they come up with doesn't seem very reasonable in, in, in the end. You know, this is the, this is the, French Revolution, Temple of Reason scenario. 
you end up with the you know the the, the terror uh, this is uh the this is going from Rousseau to um Pol Pot Rousseau was his 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 uh his hero you know so so a lot of a lot of those systems fail to understand the cosmic dimensions and therefore will be limited i think so so i'm not too i'm uh, i i hope that i persuade some people that are materialists um or there is a different group that there is a group that is open and these are groups that have seen spirituality presented as a taboo system so you know to say anything about fairies or anything like that that's you know you can't, that's so they're afraid to talk about their experience but they do have them they know that there is a spiritual world but they've been trained to not talk about it, to suppress it to disregard it now that's that's the group that that could be the uh, the a significant group that they get the courage to if they hear intelligent uh, analysis and understand that people of goodwill from different traditions uh, can talk and can share fundamental beliefs, even though they're told by the media that they're actually hugely different and want to fight each other. You know, um, so they're the group. They're they're the group that will become. That they will. The meek shall inherit the earth. They will be the ones that come out and say, "Well, actually, I've always felt something like that. I'll, actually, I've had sensei. Actually." And they're the ones that will get the courage, courage from the heart. Uh, they're the ones that will will come out of the shadows, and so so that's the one. And those ones, when they do come out, when they do understand that actually they're being they're being sold a lie, uh, they will be very resistant. They will not change when the, with the, those quiet ones that come out and discover their spiritual thing and discover their meaning. So that's that's probably the group. That that will be the part of the, to say twenty percent that will change the balance uh, over a period of time. And I wonder if that that could be what it takes to make a difference. You know, if if, if um, you know, because there are people, there are many people who uh, we're all indoctrinated into or acculturated into or condition into various ways of seeing the world, but people have their experiences and there are things that people know in their heart and perhaps seeing, perhaps seeing the beast itself uh, unveiled might be enough to not only push people who may have been on the sidelines, but who, who feel something, um, but also well, maybe that's enough to make a difference in this world or or the next, because you know there's there's a uh, two acts to this play, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you know, if, if the cur when the curtains fall on this one, there's there's um there's another uh, act and drama that no eye has seen and no ear has heard, and when we uh when we're on that side then I think many of us will, well, I think we'll all be very surprised at the things we took for granted in this world, in this act of our story. And um, we'll see a much greater reality. So, it, and maybe that's the, if, if there's, resi if even if resistance to the machine may fail on a worldly level, Right, at least we have our integrity by resisting, and whatever we might lose, perhaps in this worldly life, perhaps just the act of resisting and encouraging others to resist, um, in terms of matters of salvation or you know whatever term someone wants to use for it, it matters. Right, right. It matters to if someone's a martyr. You know, both Christianity and Islam have the concept of the martyr. It's it's conceived differently, but that concept is sacrifice, like you mentioned, sacrifice. You know, to sacrifice 
yourself in a worthy cause. And if you if 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 the machine grinds you up and you are speaking against it, then you're asserting that you know, the, the spirit of truth is moving there and that matters. But it, it doesn't all of our lives end, but how they end is of paramount importance. And maybe that, that's an empowering message perhaps to, for, for people to realize that, okay, maybe the powers that be, okay, maybe they're writing their final act. They feel triumphant. They're ready to um, get into our nerves and get under our skin. But just denying it and saying no and standing against it absolutely matters. And it's not a hour for hopelessness, I guess. I don't have the words to well, say what I feel, but... The, uh, as the famous or variants of the quotes, uh, a brave man dies but once but a coward dies a thousand times i mean think that's that's uh important so um the the feature that we didn't necessarily mention but is implicit in prometheus satan lucifer whatever we want to call it uh all the fallen angels is pride mm -hmm. and this is this is the the key overriding sin whatever way you want to call it uh, hamarsia it, it, it's it's pride and this hubris as well as a fundamental thing associated with prometheus daedalus icarus technology warned warned against us mm. supported if you want the greek mythology uh, by narcissism and falling in love with the illusion the reflection the simulacrum the wow. uh it, it's all there and this is what we've been uh, we, we it takes our attention away from the things from the echo from the and the gods will punish us for for, for, for that nemesis they will punish us in accordance with the, the marian apparitions they say at this stage of the well there's various ones that say it's going to be illumination of conscious conscious for everybody that there's going to be like a what i interpret as a collective near the death experience and if there's not a, a, a an accommodation, there will be a, a you know a, a massive a dark uh, phase, but uh, of intervention. Now you can interpret that as a physical intervention if you want to, uh, which is very very likely. Of course, the volcanoes. Of, of, I think we won't have global warming problems with you know winter things, and this darkness has always been predicted, and it's historically verifiable cycle in relation to the volcanoes north america iceland uh, uh and krakatoa and those uh, go off like it did in 536 which was important and irish catholicism which even some trace to the that they link that to the fall of the roman empire and even the rise ultimately of islam through changes in yemen and that so, so these things are significant so that might be the type of intervention if you want to see it as divine or not a physical if you want a physical one but like in this mythology of Atlantis, it's the technological overreach. It's the hubris. It's everything is telling us not to, to go beyond that. Everything is telling us to make technology a servant of the human and not a master. And once they do, whatever conception of history, prehistory, mythology, the gods or theology, say you're going to get punished uh so so in many senses uh, uh you know what what can you say if that's what people want you know let the good times roll uh, and ultimately we have to look after ourselves you know we can only say you know not speak our truth try and speak that truth uh and we have to continue planting the tree and and and, and uh my my uh mother-in-law very impressed with all the you know she's interested in world affairs but she always looks out for a garden and it's a great peace and comfort to her uh to her and i admire 
uh, I admire people like that that do ordinary things and do ordinary things well. I have more and more respect uh, and for older people that just were successful at living their lives. And, and so this is important. So that that's so we can't with all these things going in the ether, you have to do the ordinary things. In fact, you have to pay attention. In fact, if even if you take a scientific perspective, if you look at what the scientists are saying, in the fine-tuned universe, the, uh, the chances of this thing happening uh, now that we exist, that it's existence that we're taking for granted, the existence itself, the, we're being told it's a, great, uh, it's a great tragedy, our existence, whereas it's a great miracle that we can have these conversations, that we exist, that we wake up in the morning, that we have all these problems that we have, they're fantastic. So really the joy of life, we have to recover that. So I'm not in favor of that doomsday thing. I think this is going to happen. I'm a pragmatist. I'm a pragmatic cosmopolitanist. That's my system of knowledge. I say, here, look, I think from the evidence, this is going to happen. I don't care what you, what, what you think about it. That's all I can believe. And, and, and you tell me what you, you think, if you have something to say, I'll listen to it. Uh, but if I come to this thing, if I can say, well, something's going to happen, if I can say before it's going to happen that there's going to be a war in Ukraine or the monkeypox is coming, on, you know what I mean? Actually, funny enough, those little things are things that people people uh, notice. And they say, oh, there must be something. Uh, although... You can end up doing fortune telling. I'm not going to do that, but it's the deeper things that I would point to. And I don't mind if sometimes or what you say plays out because people say, hold on a second, that's what the boy said was going to happen. Yeah, well, look at the bigger argument then. And, and uh, um, also, there's a liberating thing about knowing truth, even if, even if it's a hard truth, to know what actually is happening. Is a liberating thing. You don't have to spend energy on on that. You don't have to misspend your energy. You know what you're dealing with. That that's uh, and get on with it. That's 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 human nature and human existence. So uh, yes, uh, I, I agree with you um, that um, you, one has to be uh, positive, look after, accept the majesty of life, accept the gift of life, accept with gratitude, and even the even the problems of life. And I hear among the alternative community people that are very good on the critique uh, who are who are who don't profess and are quite hostile to the traditional the book, if you like, or the people of the book, but you know whose analysis is correct. And I hear them saying, "Well, if there was a God, how could a particular thing they point to a particular thing happen? That proves that there's no God, but." It doesn't to me. Uh, the what it proves is that we're in a place where we have a choice, where we have free will, uh, and there's enough evidence that of miraculous, uh, grander scheme of things that put us here uh, to not want to deny that in the approach to any of these problems. So um, a lot of those arguments are theologically flimsy and as i said there has to be a discipline in the presentation of mm -hmm. facts and the analysis of facts and also in reference to the mo what you're talking about the streams of intellectual thought the history and traditions and systems and things we've learned from different systems of knowledge we have to apply them we can't be dismissive we have to be careful we have to be scholarly we have to be able to uh, inform our our our, our our arguments. So mm. uh, if you're looking at someone, if you're looking at like knowledge and the sacred or works like that by um, Sayed, uh, Hussein Nasser, as I've said, you know, you can understand that he didn't come to this lightly. He came to this from, a, you know, a deep study and deep argumentation and deep reflection and deep spirituality. And really, these arguments require that and we can't dismiss them. We can't be great on one thing and then uh, be like fools or rush into areas we don't know about. So, mm. Hopeful, yeah. Hopeful. Mm. I agree. Mm. Well, James, I um, I need to get going to pick my wife up from the bus stop yeah. shortly. And yeah. uh, also, my goodness, it must be like nine or ten where you're at. 
right now. It's eleven here, yeah. So, oh. but uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm for bed, but uh, oh. I've enjoyed this this greatly. And if um, if you're open to doing it again, I would be more than more than delighted. Uh, certainly, uh, Kamal, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to explore, and I like your I like your emphasis on on bridging minds, and uh, I like. And I feel sympathetic towards your analysis and openness and exploratory uh, style, and uh, also your your scholarly uh, approach to it. It's, it's important, and um, your humaneness. So, so I appreciate the conversations. Thank you. And I appreciate uh, your 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 rigor, your your scholarly and also poetic approach to these subjects, and and to everything in your the, the way you, everything is spiritually informed for you and um it's 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 absolutely a pleasure and honor so oh and also i was um Thank i was talking with thomas the other day i i haven't seen him in a while so i'm going to try to catch up with him but i think he he mentioned that he was uh looking to uh i think he was going to go back to recording so yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk. We're gonna we're gonna arrange something as well. Yes, so. I I can't wait to see that. I'm a fan. So yeah, right. Okay, thank you very much, and Welcome, thank say you. hello to your wife and give her my uh, best wishes. I will indeed. You have a good night, yeah. and all the best yeah. to you and your family. Yeah. Good luck. Bye -bye. You too. Thanks.